This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. Gotham City, like any other large metropolis, abounds in girls of all shapes and sizes. Debutantes, nurses, stenographers, and librarians. Gotham City Library, Miss Gordon speaker. Lopez hair removal, this is Jose. Holy transformation. One minute, plain Barbara Gordon, librarian and Commissioner Gordon's daughter. And the next minute, something new has been added. Batgirl, modeled after her idol, Batman. Holy apparition! No, boy wonder, I'm Batgirl. You are no longer alone, Cape Crusader. It took me three years to track down the Jade Gato, and three more to figure out how to steal it. Funny, it only took me ten minutes to figure out how to snatch it back. No matter how you do it, crime doesn't pay girls. collectible comic book store. Mile High Comics has an inventory of over 5 million comics from the gold, silver, bronze, and modern age, and over 100,000 trade paperbacks. If you're not into the vintage stock, Mile High Comics also has a subscription service called the New Issue Comics Express, offering a discounted price for comics right to the shelves. So if you're looking for vintage back issues or a great modern subscription service, be sure to check out milehighcomics.com. Well, it's been a long time since I've had this guy on here and the first time on Zoom. 
But there is a reason why I wanted him on this episode, which we'll, of course, talk about. But this is my podcasting brother, my big bro. Yeah, it's Tom Panaris. Welcome back. Hi. <laughs> this is weird. This is my first time on video, yet I spent the better part of an entire year doing this from this very seat in front of an average of 20 teenagers per hour. <laughs> <laughs> this is still very weird. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was commenting before we started recording <laughs> that your background like sums you up to a T just with all of the images and everything. I'm like, yeah, you can just look yes. at that and be like, yeah, that's Tom Panneries right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, credit, credit to Luke Dobb for the Teen Titans. Oh. Print. I, I bought it off of him at the Baltimore Comic Con. So, that yeah, was, it's got a Luke Dobb feel about it. It is, it is a Luke Dobb print. So, yeah. It's, <laughs> and then below that, of course, is. Uh, the Justice League by uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Praise be his name. So <laughs> the Teen Titans comes at a good time when we see the the Nightwing eighty eight mm-hmm. that we'll discuss. Which I wasn't expecting them to pop up, but we'll. Yeah, I'm sure no you'll have a lot coming. of fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'll have a fun, a lot of fun talking about it, and we can yeah. of course talk about you know who popping up in that issue. Uh, well, Freedom? yes, exactly. That's who I'm talking about. Well, I am happy to have you on here. The reason why, actually, I wanted you in particular to come on here. First of all, I did. I remember reached out to you before mm-hmm. and said, man, it's been a long time since you've been on. Is there anything you want? And you had mentioned like Terry Moore had done an arc. And mm-hmm. lo and behold, Terry Moore is on this arc that we're doing. It came up pretty quickly. But we've got a pretty solid history, I think, you and I with Terry Moore. Yeah. I started reading Strangers in Paradise 2000. Two, I think 2000, yeah, 2002, I think is when I read, started reading the trades that uh, a friend of mine who I met after college was just basically would loan me just a ton of comics, you know, like, Hey, like I, we'd hang out and be like, you know, and so he loaned me Sandman, he loaned me a bunch of other stuff uh, that I'd never read or read bits and pieces of or whatever. And uh, he said, have you ever read strangers in paradise? It was the only thing that Terry Moore was producing at the time. And um, I I had heard of it because I saw it enough in previews and was actually always kind of curious because it was a well-regarded comic book that at different points in time was he was being published by a different couple of companies. At one point, it was published by Image for a little bit. And then I think more just started self-publishing after that. It was a, like, I would read the solicits and it sounded really interesting because it had nothing to do with superheroes or anything else that, you know, everybody else was doing. And the only other comic that I could think of that I'd heard of, but still had not read uh, that was in the same vein would be like Love and Rockets or something like mm. that. And so I, it was always kind of curious about it. Never read it. And he loaned it to me and he had loaned, and I was, I think they were up to um, book nine. <laughs> I think was as as far as he had gotten at that point. And then I started buying it in trade um, after that all the way till its end. So I read it. I read it kind of in the back half of its first run, completely missed Echo. Um, probably because and I want to say the reason I missed it was because when Echo came out, I think I was broke. So <laughs> it's just one of those things I never bought sure. it. But then I, I bought the complete Echo off of him at, a, at, a, at the Baltimore Con and also bought Rachel Rising um, in trade. And then since then, uh, the only thing I haven't read, and I think you have, and I still have to go buy this trade is Motor Girl. Um, I don't, again, that might've been a thing where I just, it, I just missed it for some reason. Yeah. But yeah, we have long history with Terry Moore. Yeah. Um, met him several times, have a lot of trades signed by him <laughs> and such. So this is really, it's, it's really cool to be here to talk about something you did. Cause I haven't read a lot of his stuff that's beyond his self-published stuff. Yeah. I knew of him like in name only but didn't really associate who he was so i think i had known that he was on here i feel like maybe he did a teen titans arc but i could be wrong about that i think he definitely did one of the volumes of spider-man loves mary jane Mm -hmm. but it was i felt like it wasn't as good as the original stuff so it's not like i was yeah i'm not associating like this guy with great things i had heard Mm -hmm. of strangers in paradise from one of my castmates on Spider-Man Crawl Space, but you, it's really ironic because you're saying that someone gave you Strangers in Paradise <laughs> and you were the one who gave me, I'm pretty sure Rachel Rising was the first thing that you lent me that I read of his 
that's mm-hmm. like his own creative uh, work. And I really liked it. I mean, there's so much to to dig in with that particular tale, but you, the characters are just so fleshed out. And, and the fact that the majority of his stories, if not all of them are like female led and he just crafts mm. these really strong and well-developed and sometimes flawed, oftentimes flawed female characters is just a great testament to his writing. And so I think you've lent me several copies of different things at you lent me yeah. an echo motor girl. I got from him at Baltimore comic con and had him sign and I'm waiting to get cereal when that comes out in mm-hmm. trade form. So I feel like everything that he's done, that's his own. I've really enjoyed I've, yeah. 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 He, when it comes to female characters, it, it is really fascinating how well he writes them and how he will have fun with some of the tropes of comic book female characters. Like sometimes he'll, he'll introduce them and then just kind of turn the trope on its head. I, I always think of Casey from strangers in paradise. It's, <laughs> it's very, she's a very tropey character when sure. she starts out, but it's like, once you start to develop that character, he, he, plays with that and has fun with it and makes her a very likable and be three-dimensional yeah uh beyond you know um just kind of the very because she's kind of a bimbo when she's yeah. you know she's like the she i think she's dating freddie or somebody i'm trying to remember it's been a while since i did my reread but yeah she, that's how she kind of comes in their lives and i, I should plug over at two true freaks the uh the, the two freaks has an audio uh, drama production company And they are doing an audio, a full cast audio adaptation of Strangers in Paradise. And I believe they're on book three at the moment. Okay. So uh, you can go to twotruefreaks.com to see that. I'm not involved with it, but but Gene Hendricks and uh, Thomas DJ and them are doing a great job with it. So and, and more gave him the blessing and everything and like you know so it's all you know it's official in a sense it's, yeah. it's really, really cool to see that they're doing that. Yeah. and he's all about the shipping that's one of the reasons why i love his <laughs> works too and some yes. really odd couples like i love jet and earl <laughs> mm-hmm. like those are just you wouldn't imagine those two together but it's just it's so lovely how they work together and how well, you have to read it. So what I'm about to say doesn't make any sense. But the yeah. fact that she can actually feel him and feel his warmth, whereas everyone else, she can't. So just some some great stuff. Well, before we get into it, into it, uh, we do have to do our Find Our Joy segment, a.k.a. Shag's Mac and Cheese of Comfort and Joy, your, your BFF. So what, if anything, has been giving you some joy in some of these troubling Omicron times? What's joy? I'm between joy at the moment. <laughs> between joy at the moment. I'm trying. I was trying to think of this. The last uh, January has been crazy. I've had five days of work in January so far because wow. we missed the entire week due to snow, and then we missed every. Tomorrow we're supposed to. We're recording this on a Wednesday night, and tomorrow we're supposed to go back on a two-hour delay. I probably will happen, but you know, so it's been, it's just been um, kind of like everything's been thrown out of whack. Um, I got a, quite a few books for Christmas and um, have been watching, just been watching movies and stuff. Um, so I can just tell, I guess on the movie side of things, uh, we watched both a quiet place movies and I really, really enjoyed them. Really loved far from home, not far from home, no way home. Spider-Man and have been enjoying the book of Boba Fett. So it's just kind of, and just catching up on like, you know, we have just kind of a, a ro- running rotation of shows that we work our way through. So it's just been kind of fun to, after all the holiday programming and after all of the, like, you know, let's watch this movie or whatever, it's been kind of fun to just get back and, and like try to empty our DVR of all of the various episodes of Batwoman and legends of tomorrow <laughs> that we have on there. Sure. Um, I think well, Supergirl is done because we worked through Supergirl. Uh, Superman and Lois just started, and uh, again, and I haven't watched that yet. And um, I think I think I'm gonna watch. I, I taped the five part thing that started the Flash this season, but after last season, I think I'm done with the Flash. But you know, I'm holding. I you know, we hold on to those CW shows for, for pretty long. And the Flash is in its like eighth or ninth season, and you know, by then that show like that can get pretty stale. Yeah. But uh, but no, we're enjoying that, and then just our, our usual. Um, God, I listen to so many podcasts, <laughs> so. You know, um, true crime podcasts, uh, movie podcast, you know, everything. So it's just kind of a, a it's it's me just trying to find sanity in the in, in the midst of everything. I think the most 
daily find your joy part of things for me, at least at work, is that I insist on not being on my computer and take picking out a book during my lunch half hour um, and just reading. And it's whatever I happen to be reading at the moment. I mean, granted, right now I'm reading The Bell Jar, which is not exactly an uplifting book. Oh, but, you yeah. know, I was reading, um, right before Christmas, I was reading Marvel Saga. I just read some uh, some Batman stuff and just reread a, a few. Uh, and I've been re- re- I've been reading through the Jack Knight Starman series. So, yeah, just it's kind of like all over the place. I try to find it where I can. Sure. Yeah. No, I get that for sure. I just to pick up of your TV shows. I just started watching and now i'm i just finished season or series for this tonight before we started peaky blinders which i've been enjoying and i love the 20s so that's really great <laughs> and then it's got you know some mafia yeah, I, and yeah gang gang related things yeah i watched i we watched the first season and we keep meaning to pick it back up so it's yeah but from what we've seen of it we really like it but it's one of those sometimes we'll we'll start a show and then like, oh, crap, we still have, like, I still have to finish season two of Ted Lasso. So, <laughs> sure. Know. Yeah. Oh, I've heard good things about that. One of my friends it's said she was really surprised funny. I wasn't watching it because I'm such a football fan. Oh, so I'll really have funny. to, yeah, I'll start that. Today was day one of grad school. So not much happening there. I did some readings, did intro stuff. Tom has been a delight because I've been somewhat stressed out because I think the bad thing is I keep looking ahead in the syllabus and seeing all the stuff that's like coming. Don't do that. I, <laughs> so I'm like, I don't even know what a KUD is. You know- and uh, so uh, I'm no, like texting no, Tom. Yeah. It, it means no, understand, and do. It's part of a lesson plan. Okay. So the student will know this, understand this, and then and do, do this. this. Okay. It's actually on every one of my lesson plans. Okay. That, yeah. But um, anyway, let's see, I, I keep... had text at 1022, yeah, text see? at 1027. <laughs> He's like my counselor to be like, it'll be okay, Stella. It'll be okay. But everything seems like really intense and hard right now. And I keep thinking, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, what if I fail this course? What if, you know, and then I don't get this degree. Was this all worth it? So I just need to take it a day at a time and try to call myself but i'm thankful for you because you oh. helped and and talked me through them like you'll be fine so you're a good you, person to have and you've you been will. through that experience so that you're a yeah. good point person to have yeah in fact i did pretty much more or less the same program i mean yeah. i did it five years ago so or yeah. six years ago now so it's probably changed a little bit since then but some of the stuff you've mentioned yeah you're i was there so yeah. i remember doing it and i still funny enough i still have everything except for some of the paperbacks that i rented from amazon and not bought so uh, yeah but yeah i'm hoping notes. i won't have to they're saying one of them's definitely like an e-book i can get and then mm-hmm. there are this other course the literacy course that i'm taking there are lots of required texts but i guess you can get two up to two chapters free from uva library mm-hmm. so hopefully i'll be okay so that but that's still it's an exciting time of like okay well my journey's continuing are you are you a patriots fan because i'm about to say something unfortunate football yeah no i'm a giants fan but oh, even then, okay. i haven't so watched the NFL. i haven't watched the nfl <laughs> okay. in like three or four years so okay no, I'm a giants oh we're fan. okay i was i would like to remind you <laughs> and and as a giants fan i i yes. do have i am required to remind people that the giants beat tom brady's patriots twice Ooh. in the super bowl okay so. Well, that's fine. I don't I don't have I'll hold on to that. I have no connection to Tom Brady, but I am excited because the Bills, they they beat they slaughtered, I would say (laughs) the Patriots. I mean, Josh Allen was on fire, but that's why I'm wearing my Buffalo Bills hat. Uh, Unfortunately, they're up against the Chiefs and that's who defeated Mm. them last year. So I don't know. Uh, Mahomes is a great quarterback, so I guess we'll see what happens. But I'm excited about that. And then. My final joy, I think, is that I am going to NYC. I think Carolyn and I had been talking about we weren't sure yet, but I won tickets to see a Broadway show. I just I wrote a short essay and it was chosen and I got to choose which show. So we're going to see Company, which we were supposed to see before COVID. So she and I are going to go see that. And then just spur of the moment last, I guess it was yesterday. She's like, should we see another show? Because I had chosen a matinee. 
So it's like, you know what? We're on Broadway. We've got free tickets. Why not? So now, fingers crossed, I mean, we're going to go see The Music Man with Hugh Jackman and Sutton Foster. Fingers crossed because you just don't know. COVID has been shutting down shows. Sometimes Mm -hmm. you don't know. You could be in the seat and then be like, so sorry. Or you might miss a leading cast member. But I was telling her one of the reasons we decided is that both Sutton and Hugh have had COVID. Not saying that that's, you know, you're not going to get it again. But I'm just like, well, it'd be so soon after. Afterwards, so if anything, they'll just cancel the whole, sh- whole show, and then we won't have missed anything. So I'm excited about that, and spending time with her and and seeing a show is always a privilege and a blessing. So yeah, there you go. Cool. Yeah, okay. hopefully I'll be able to make it back up to New York City. We're supposed to go in December and yeah. cancel because of COVID. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. As my message, I feel like I haven't said it in a while, and I know it depends on your political affiliations and your belief systems potentially, but I do strongly suggest and advise still wearing masks. I think that I I know that some people are just like, that doesn't help or anything, but I, I think that it does still somewhat help and and being safe and cautious for yourself as well as for others. I think empathy, right? Empathy and compassion Mm -hmm. is really big. So maybe put up with some uncomfortableness because you don't like masks just to, to help other people. I mean, I, we both work in places that are basically Petri dishes. Oh yeah. And I mean, I've been wearing, I don't, I, I don't think there's a single person I know who enjoys being masked up maybe some people do and it's a you know but i I don't like it but whatever like i don't know i don't know it's just second nature to me at this point i am kind of getting sick of wearing them but i have also not been sick yet so i would rather not get sick absolutely yeah (laughs) and have to take time off and have to deal with you know even if it's mild having to quarantine for the number of days my school district says and all the logistical crap that i would have to go to go through because i've been exposed and i was and i tested positive or something i'd hate you know yeah and then your family too would have to stay yeah and then my family has to do yeah it's just like no i mean even just even on that minor level yeah you know which i'm so i'm not trivializing anybody who got like long COVID or is really sick or has, has died. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, very serious thing, but even on the mild level, like, oh, everyone's going to get it. The crap you've got to go through. It just, it's not worth It's just not worth it. Just wear it. <laughs> He's on his soapbox. I am yeah. off my soapbox. now. I will say they don't bother me now. I wear two of them at work. I work at a hospital, so it's kind mm-hmm. of like a big thing, but I feel like now because it's like oxygen deprivation that I can run more easily now because I feel like my (laughs) lungs have expanded. So I don't huff and puff as much when I'm running. But um, yeah, I usually try to get out during lunch either to walk or I sit out and and read a book because I just need to leave the enclosed area of the office anyways or aren't Mm -hmm. any windows. But then, yeah, I can just like breathe and, and be out there in the outside. So so anyways, yeah, continue to be cautious. Okay, so we're going to get on to this. I just have one vintage quickie, which is Robin, and then we're going to do Birds of Prey, our Birds of Prey arc, 47, 48, 49. So this quickie from Robin, it is 108, and the comicsology, I guess it was the publisher synopsis, Drury Walker, the man known as Caraxes, is running around committing multiple crimes in Gotham faster than Robin can keep up with him. Meanwhile, Caraxes is holed up downtown. What the heck is going on? Even an able assist from Nightwing can't keep Robin from getting in over his head. And where Babs appears, Tim is radioing her when he spots Caraxes and she tells him to wait for Dick to come to him and he kind of rushes on ahead, but that was basically it. So there was no need to really cover all of that. <laughs> so I, the, I yeah. may have bought this issue off the stand. I, I was, I bought Robin for a very long time. I just don't remember what my last issue was. Gotcha. Yeah. I want to say it was right around. I think my last issue might've been around like 125. Okay. And I bought it for a little while during like infinite crisis. Oh, infinite crisis. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, the main event, some birds of prey. So Tom yeah. has graciously agreed to do a synopsis for this arc. And then we will, so you can do the whole thing. And then we yeah. will split them up and talk about them individually. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So I'm going to go all the way through with birds of prey number 47, 48, and 49. And they all have the same creative team throughout. So I'm just going to run down the creative team right away. Uh, Terry Moore is our writer. Art is Amanda Connor on pencils and Jimmy Palmiotti on inks. Brian Miller does colors separations by hi-fi. Albert de Guzman is the letterer. 
The editor was Lysa Hawkins. Each of the colors is by Phil Noto, and they are absolutely gorgeous. Oh, yeah. I love Phil Noto's covers on this series. Agreed. Like, yep. even back when I would see it in previews, I was always like, they just were amazing. And I remember at one point, I think Ed Benes takes over the covers. Oh, yeah. And I was <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's interesting so, to say because Ed Benes is a pretty good artist. He is a good artist. Yeah. He is a good artist. But like, you know, sometimes it's like Ed. Not every woman has a C cup. <laughs> At least it's not Jim Balin. Um, Anyway, our release dates, cover dates, November and December of 2002 and January 2003. Release dates, September 18th, 2002, October 23rd, 2002, and November 20th of 2002. Uh, This is a three-part storyline called The Chaotic Code, and part one is called Icarus Rising. We open on a LexCorp satellite and the words of President Lex Luthor, who is giving a press conference announcing some huge scientific breakthrough that is going to be, according to him, the hope of all mankind. We then cut to an apartment where a bruised woman is being held hostage by a man named Willie who is screaming at the television and waving around a gun. Black Canary busts through the window and they start fighting. Meanwhile, Barbara Gordon is hanging upside down in her sweatpants on some board doing what I assume is some sort of exercise type of thing uh, while talking on the phone to Senator Fitzgerald about the LexCorp breakthrough. And she says that she's interested in whatever this is and would like to accompany him to the demonstration in New York that Luther is announcing. And he will they will meet up with Atticus Black Blackaber or Blackaber, the LexCorp scientist who made the breakthrough. Dinah has Willie all tied up and duct taped while they wait for the police, and she meets Babs the next day. They travel to New York, and Babs travels up the stairs of the building in her sweet new wheelchair and heads into the press conference. Talia, who I believe is, is Talia is Luther's chief of staff. Oh, see, I was confused because I'm like, is this Talia Al Ghul? That is Talia Al Ghul. Oh, oh, oh okay. but I, I think I can't remember what position she held. I want to say she's the chief of staff. It's, she's not the vice president. But um, this is the first time I've encountered her with Lex Luthor. Okay. So your guess is as good as mine. All right. Well, she introduces Black Aver and who talks about how he's essentially found a way to extend life almost to cure for death in a way. And it lies in the hands of a 17 year old girl named Madison, who is a citizen of a country called Altavia. He has Madison's blood drawn while prattling on about something called the chaos code and introduces Madison as someone who, quote, has control over her own chaotic code. Madison glances at Babs with a worried look. Outside of the New York building, Dinah argues with what looks like a Secret Service man over where her car is parked, and he pulls out a pistol and takes her hostage. Back inside, Madison does a live demonstration of what is essentially a healing power on Senator Boucher, whose heart condition is magically healed. Barbara gets skeptical about whether or not Madison's power will last very long. M- meanwhile, Dinah's still being held hostage in the RCV, but she's being forced to drive somewhere. So what does she do? She throws in a reverse and mistakenly crashes it into a telephone pole and then, and then goes forward, sending her assailant through the windshield. For some reason, this does not render him unconscious. Or dead. <laughs> or dead. Like, he hits the damn windshield. This guy should be out. Yeah. But nope. He does try to pull the gun on her, and she just sends his head through the window, and that does the trick. Barbara continues to press press Black Aver on the effects of Madison's powers, and he responds by having her have Madison touch Barbara's legs, which she can then feel. Madison whispers, please, Barbara Gordon, help me, while Dinah screams over the radio that she needs help. And she does, because there are several men in suits pointing guns at her. Part two, Crash and Burn, opens with Barbara still astonished that she can feel her legs. And I'm, <laughs> just think of Dr. Strangelove. Oh, like, yeah. sure, I can walk. Uh, but several people brandishing guns have now entered the room. So the joy is a little bit short lived. Uh, they attempt to kidnap Madison, who blasts them with some sort of energy, while Babs breaks out what looks like nunchucks and fights off some of the attackers she then goes full bat girl and takes out several thugs before jumping out of a window and swinging to safety diana sits in the back of the van surrounded by her kidnappers who were working with the armed men in the building after some witty banter she starts beating up the guys in the back of the van panicked the driver takes off 
Babs and Madison are on the streets of New York with Babs more than happy to stretch her legs while Madison worries that Black Aver will come for her. They get into a cab and after making a phone call, she tells the driver to head to a private terminal at JFK. I have to say, just just because this this is a really weird like synopsis, the pages go back and forth between Barbara and Black Canary yeah. through most of this issue. So you are cutting back and forth between scenes. It's very it's actually very television. Uh, this, whole, this whole arc is very much like a television show. Sure. All right. So we're now back at the remains of the press conference. Black Aver claims that their attackers are Altavian forces who are trying to abduct Madison. He's also very curious as to who this Barbara Gordon is and why she's such a good fighter. Diana digs her among her unconscious kidnappers and supply and the supplies that are in the back of the van. She finds a shovel or a spade. And she starts slamming it against the shield between her and her driver. She then waits for one of the thugs to wake up and finds out that, well, they're just hired guns. They have no idea who they're working for. They, and they have no ideals. They're just in it for the money. Barbara is in the air trying to get some answers from people on the ground and from Madison. She lets Madison sleep while she fields a call from Senator Fitzgerald, who tells her that Senator Boucher is dead. And just as he does that, Barbara drops to the floor unconscious. We then cut to Dinah, who uses her sonic scream to blast the back of the van open, but the panicked driver see- sends it over the side of a bridge and toward a river. Finally, part three, Family Matters. Oh, no- that's a good show. No, oh, God, that show is horrible. <laughs> Kidding me? Oh, boy. So no Steve Urkel in this, but it, so Family Matters, part three opens with the van dropping into the river. Dinah lands in behind it. She's fine, though. On the play, Madison wakes up and sees Barbara unconscious. She wakes up and Madison offers to restore her, but Bab says that she might actually not survive another healing. Just then, the pilot comes on the intercom to say that they're being forced to make an emergency landing and that Madison says that Black Aver has found her via a tracking device that he's implanted under her skin. Black Canary resurfaces and hears Oracle's SOS just before her waterlogged comms go on the fritz. She's also pulled all the thugs out of the river, but they are not long for this world because they're all wearing kill collars under their skin. And whomever hired them knows they failed in their mission, so their heads all go splat. There's Amanda Waller. Plane lands at JFK and Black Aver walks aboard. Babs tells Madison to run and Black Aver says, Ah, Miss Gordon, every time I see you, you're going down. Really, Terry? (laughs) <laughs> she responds by hopping. She responds by hopping on a food cart with a fire extinguisher, and sends herself off the wing of the plane. But then she lands on her back. Out in the sticks, Canary comes across a guy taking a leak near a billboard and steals his motorcycle. But she leaves him a nice note on where to find it. Back at JFK, Black Aver gives the big villain speech, telling Babs his plan to clone Madison and weaponize her powers. Just then, Canary comes flying over the chain link fence on the motorcycle, takes out a few of Black Aver's men, and then comes face to face with Talia. The two fight while Babs makes her move and starts hitting people with the fire extinguisher, and Madison makes a run for it. Black Aver catches up to her, and Madison responds by burning his hands and revealing to the audience that he is her father. Ooh. Talia and Canary continue to fight until Canary throws Talia into a charged up Madison, barbecuing the villainous. Diana picks everyone up, gets them on the motorcycle, and takes them away. At the, at the White House, Lex is on the phone with Black Aver and says that he's sending two of his assistants to over to help him move to a better facility. That can't be good. No. Then we cut to the Barbara Boucher School for Girls. They're dropping Madison off here as it's the boarding school where she's going to live. Babs and Dinah are happy that she's protected, but when Madison enters her dorm room, she sees a dozen roses and a card that reads, good luck at your new school, Madison. I'm so proud of you and we'll call you soon your friend, Talia. The end for now. I just looked at the back of 48 and look, speak of the devil. Uh, Can you believe it? Look at how young he looks. It's He's Tom my Brady age. People. Well, Tom, where's your milk mustache? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Tom, for doing that lovely synopsis. You're welcome. Okay. So we'll split these guys up. And I do like to talk about the covers. And I think attention should be paid to them because you and I agree that Phil Noto does some amazing work. Now you can, yeah. he's one of those that I can always spot like, oh, that's Phil Noda. So first cover, 
It is the uh, not hashtag Carolyn knows because we actually see all of Barbara. So that doesn't happen <laughs> all of the time. Um, we see all of Barbara on all three of these covers. Yes, which is great. And I think it's appropriate given what she goes through or what her arc yeah. is in, in that story. Uh, we've got Canary hitting, I guess, just an agent. I'm not sure yeah. what's happening up here on West. I think that's supposed to be Madison. You know, okay. The girl. And her, uh, and her power and everything. Yeah. Thoughts and then, on, and of course, Lex, who Lex, doesn't play yeah. too much of a part, but he's his floating head right there. Thoughts on this cover and how it's laid out. And would you be able to look at it and be like, Oh, I can. Yeah. It matches what the story is about. It does. It tells you some images that are in the story. It's very reminiscent of like George Perez used to do covers like this from time to time, where it's just this kind of big collage of like things that are associated with the story or events that are in the story. So yeah, it's fine. It's actually out of the three, it's probably the, my third favorite of the three. I mean, that's, that's really not saying (laughs) they're all beautiful. So it's like, you know, but, but if I, if I have to rank them, um, this is, this is toward the, this is the bottom of that list. Mainly because it's it's a little. I think it's just a little busy. It's um, what Babs is looking at off yeah screen. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that he didn't perhaps angle her towards us in the way that mm-hmm. he had angled the floating. Yeah, head so that they could have been a mirror image. Otherwise, it would have made more sense to have Lex's like in profile or something like that. Yeah. I also thought of you. It's kind of weird to say that this little black bubble right here, which says oh, yeah. it's in remembrance or we remember 9-11. 9/11. So it had been one year. But I say that because Tom had just produced a really well done mm-hmm. limited oh, series on 9-11 and, and different media and things that uh, came about afterwards or yeah, mm-hmm. so like poetry and books and everything. And that's on Two True Freaks. So I really recommend listening to that. Thanks. Okay. Of course, it comes from the heart. Um, what do you think about this first issue here? I thought, like I said, this whole thing felt like three alias was on at the time. So <laughs> it reminded me like it had that pace to it. I loved alias, especially in its first like three seasons. Yeah. And it had that like it, it has a great intro of this press conference it's going to set up the whole thing because like the entire second issue takes place with at least with barbara in that building and then they take it out so it's it is a truly like a three-act structure of this story and we, we get this establishing shot of the and you know and everything but then like we have dinah just beating somebody up because we just need an action scene of dinah beating somebody up and it yeah. totally it totally works it's very much like you know, like how they introduced Natasha in the first Avengers movie. Like she's she was in Iron Man two prior prior, but when when Natasha shows up in in Avengers, she's tied to a chair and she just she was you know getting the information out. Everybody yeah. gets the phone call and then just beats everybody up. It's just sort of like it's a great establishing thing for 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 Dinah, and it's a great fight too. She's beating up this guy who's basically a domestic abuser. We don't really need to know why he's there. He never yeah. appears anything else. She just, here's a thug who was in trouble. He was holding this woman hostage. She's coming in and taking care of it. And then that's good. And I, I love it. And I love how, you know, she basically essentially answers the phone in the middle of it, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, we cut later. So I, I love the opening to this. And this sets up everything really well. His whole science mumbo jumbo about the chaotic code or whatever it's just believable enough that i'm like yeah okay you know we'll it's comics it. yeah yeah you'll go with it okay it's so basically she's got she's if this were marvel she'd be a mutant oh yeah <laughs> you, know, like, yeah. you know she'd be a mutant with healing powers and the healing powers and the the and we don't find out until the next issue that there's a downside to it. And I like the fact that he left that out, that, that the, the, he, he had the appropriate cliffhanger at the end of Barbara can feel her legs again. And it was like, Ooh, and you had a feeling, I had a feeling, even if I had been reading this only for the first time, and didn't have the, you know, the history of everything that came after, after that, you know, I never really read birds of prey, mm-hmm. but I knew enough about the title. I saw Barbara in enough in nightwing Robin, throughout like infinite crisis and justice league like i i knew i'd seen enough of her and i knew enough of her to know that this was not going to be a permanent thing so it works though because you're just like okay well what's gonna go wrong and, and i think that's that's a really good tease too when they're like oh yeah i can i can walk again you're like yeah this isn't gonna work <laughs> so yeah. And yeah, I've got some questions about that in particular. I do. So it's going to be unfair of me for a little bit, but I probably will be comparing subsequent writers to Chuck Dixon just because he was the one to really begin the era of Birds of Prey. So I will say 
and and I'm giving, of course, the 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 praise and the props to Terry Moore, but it did feel very Chuck Dixon esque because Chuck would always have almost a Bond like intro mm. that may relate to the mission on a whole, or it could just be a cold opening and and you see that action scene. So I'm glad that he started off like this, and you get a sense that she was on that case for a little bit because she said that he kidnapped Maria and abused her for two days. Yeah. So it seemed like it was it was a you know, a more difficult mission than it may have seemed initially, but just to have that action sequence, you're right. And because otherwise she kind of doesn't do too much. Like she, she's kidnapped almost. And so she doesn't, this is like her, her big action piece. Mm -hmm. And then, and then focusing on Barbara. So yeah, the chaotic code. Yeah. It's the answer as to why all matter moves towards chaos. So just so we can be clear about what that actually is. And so Madison is able to manipulate that and, and I guess fix things or put them the way they are. What do you think about this wheelchair that Barbara has that because of, I guess, gyroscopes and things like that, she's able to go upstairs and it is Wayne technology. Do you think that's something that it makes sense that she would have? You feel like, oh, maybe Barbara would not use that. You would like to have something that's Barbara powered. Are you okay with this? I'm fine with that. I actually didn't give it much thought. I think the design's pretty cool. I think they make he makes a quick comment about it being like things like uh, this building should be wheelchair like accessible. So it's just kind of a little nudge in that direction, which I think is a is a good thing. The wheelchair doesn't really come into play in the story very much anyway. Yeah. Like she's, she's in it. And then, and then like, once she gets her feeling the legs back, as far as we know, it's still sitting in the press conference room in New York city at the, end of the story. So, yeah. you know, she, I guess the only thing that, that comes in handy in here is there's clearly a compartment or two to hide whatever weapon she needs right. to hide, which yes. I think that, that to me is a Barbara Gordon. That's a bad girl Absolutely. thing. That was, you know, and, and that, that I thought was a, was a cool touch because it's like, yeah, that, that in very in character. Yes. And hopefully there's security on that wheelchair then Mm. because who knows what else? Yeah. Because I think a couple, maybe a battering came out, but definitely the nunchucks, which you said nunchucks for some reason. I was like, when I saw them, I thought, yeah, why aren't they a scream of sticks? But I guess we'll, we'll, we will go with them. So I think I'm like on, on the fence just because, Oh, I don't know. Why can't it just be a regular one? But we know that she has souped up the van that she uses and I know that there are some tricked out wheelchairs. So I think even though that this may be somewhat fantastical, I think it also borders into realistic. And you're right that, I mean, with Babs being sort of the queen of technology, that she would probably have something like that. Yeah. And she's pretty well established by now as Oracle. She's gone through her whole post injury arc. We saw the whole suicide squad arc. So right. by this time, it would make sense for her to have upgraded to something like this as opposed to if this were 1989, 1990, it probably wouldn't have made much sense mm-hmm. for her to get like the Professor X type of wheelchair. You know, the one he would rather than in the early 90s when Professor X was in a wheelchair that was basically like a floating golden sure. space sled, you know, <laughs> yes. kind of hovered around oh, in that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that that wouldn't. I mean, they didn't have the technology here in, in, in the DC. They're trying to ground it, no pun intended. But had she done that in the early '90s, I don't think it would have worked. Yeah, one page that I had a question on is you mentioned that Madison had seen she sees Barbara and kind of looks to her for help. That's how I read it as well. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what that this is page 12 on my um, my paper copy, but yes. does she why do you think is it just because Barbara's in the front row or close to it? Is can we read anything into it? Like, does she know who Barbara is? Why does she kind of look and see Barbara and, and think like, oh, this might be someone that could help me? I don't know how she clues into whether or not she knows who Barbara is. I think it's a little bit of because Barbara's staring at her weirdly. Mm hmm. And she looks at her and I think the first look is kind of like recognition on Madison's part that she's going to have to do something to Barbara. Mm. Cause like she, I think Madison knows why she's there. Okay. You know, she's there to do the demonstration. So she's looking at Barbara. And I think part of the look is help me, but part of the look is oh crap. I'm going to have to touch this woman and, and do this. And, and out of concern, the second part is 
it's it's part cry for help, almost part warning. It, it, I think there's a couple of things going on there. Maybe she's also trying to warn her sure. a little bit. Like I think she knows that that what she's going to do is going to ultimately hurt or and or kill. I don't think it kills Barbara because she's probably younger and healthier than the senator mm-hmm. who had the heart problem, and perhaps it was the ailment too. Considering that Barbara's um, Barbara's ailment that's cured is the loss of her feeling in her legs and not a congenital heart failure, like a heart condition. Right. She cured the other woman's heart condition and all of a sudden it bounced back and it probably, my understanding where well, I'm getting ahead of us, but my understanding of what it is, is that once it comes back, it's actually worse than it had been, or at least at first, or it's a shock at first. So, yeah. so she probably went into cardiac arrest when, when the, when the center got, got her, the heart condition came back. I, yeah, I can, I, I, believe in you. And I I agree with you. (laughs) So let's talk about that scene because there's a lot going on there. Of course, she was, Barbara was calling into question just Madison and what was going on and this chaotic code and all that. And then Madison walks up to her prodded by Atticus and uses her (laughs) manipulation of the chaotic code on her legs. So I have several questions about this. So first of all, do you feel like Barbara gave her consent to have her legs touched like this or to have this happen? I don't I don't think she really gave her consent. I think it was because she's Madison kneels down in front of her. Right. It's on page 20. Yeah. And she's like, she's doing that sort of trying to squirm away out of the chair thing. If she could yeah. move out of the chair. But is kind of trapped into it. So I, I think she just she has to she has no choice but to go along once Madison gets going. Yeah, unfortunately. Do you find that weird that Madison is doing her chaotic code touching over the legs, whereas really it's the spine that's the issue for Barbara? <laughs> No, because I think that is just an assumption being made based on what you see in a person in a wheelchair that they somehow can't use their legs. Okay. So on a on a split, like she wouldn't know that the spine, you know, like that it's a spinal you, trauma. Yeah, like she, she doesn't know Barbara, so she sees a woman, she sees this woman in a wheelchair, she automatically thinks there's something wrong with her legs and not doesn't necessarily think about her spine. Okay. So uh, that that makes sense to me. Okay. Do you, so, and you're also fine then that even though she mistakenly is working in that area, that her, it would still work. I believe so, especially since the thing covers her like entire body. When on page twenty one, yeah, page twenty one, yeah, it's like the the light of whatever it envelops her whole body, and I know that's done for effect to show the healing that's working. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it is like an electrical charge throughout, perhaps it does, you know, yeah. Um, was that cons- feeling. yeah was that consistent with the senator too was that all over her yeah that was her whole body too i see yeah. okay um so then my final question about this particular scene is that barbara's grateful she is grateful for this she says i don't know i know this won't last but i feel thank you and i do you agree that you know she would probably be grateful knowing that it would wear off at, at a point in time, or do you think that would be even more painful giving her this temporary gift for her to experience what it was like only to have that taken away from her? I think she's, I think she's kind of not thinking it through when she says, thank you. It's almost like a heat of the moment type of thing. Like she's genuinely shocked that this happened. No pun intended on the previous <laughs> panel, but she's like really surprised. She's like, yeah. Oh my, I can feel my legs. Like mm-hmm. I don't think she expected it to happen. So when that surprise happens, she's still skeptical. She's like, this isn't going to last. Yeah. It's almost like a genie granting a wish or something. It, it's like, you know, it, but it, there's, there's a euphoria in the moment. And I think she's in the moment. So it tracks with me, uh, especially since she's surprised that actually, you know, well, it didn't didn't happen at all. Yeah, I mean that she she was pretty. I don't think she thought it was going to happen. So, Sorry. yeah, I mean her her first. Well, it seems like there's some feeling. I don't know if it's pain, maybe, or just like a weird sensation. But she does mm-hmm. scream out "ah," and then she says, "My God, what have you done?" And then once that shock wears over, I think there's this new like, "Oh my gosh, I can feel my legs." So. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just have a trouble, I think, rec- reconciling, I guess, this gratefulness with the fact that she knows it's going to wear off and just how painful that is, in fact, going to be, which I think we see it. I think Terry Moore does a good job later on. Mm-hmm. I guess it'd be 49 where it does wear off. And she's like, oh, my gosh, I am going to no prize it okay. by saying that along with the physical cure, mm-hmm. there's a almost like a, a high like a psychological high that's going on. Okay. So you are kind of blissed out because of what happened. And in that moment, you're not thinking rationally of like, so if, if he said like, we have a complicated surgical procedure that we're going to do for you to give your legs back from blah, blah, blah. She probably would have thought about it through and been like, no, 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 this isn't going to happen. I'm not going to do a blah, blah, blah. Like we could have had that more intellectual conversation, but to be completely honest, I think it's just, I think she gets zapped and in the zap, it's maybe too adrenaline or maybe it's something else, but there's some sort of sense of euphoria that comes in there. And that's, so that's my no prize. There's a, there's a psychochemical reaction in addition to the physical. Yeah. I can get on board with your no prize. (laughs) Final it makes question. the crash when they come down yeah, even more even potent worse. too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. My last question kind of bleeds over to the next issue, but I just wonder why Dinah never really used her canary cry initially. Like there were several instances where I thought, why aren't you using your canary cry? <laughs> you could get yourself out of this situation. Does she, um, does she need to recharge? Is it something like she does? So it's a last resort. I don't know. I don't, I haven't been reading enough of it to know the extent of her powers. Is it like one of those things where she can, she only can use it so every so often or else she, you know, like it has to recharge itself or she should be good to go. I mean, the whole reason why she was healed because she was dropped in that Lazarus pit. So she's, I don't think she can just, uh, yeah. And she didn't use it at all in this issue. Not even with that. Did she use it with that guy? I don't think so. No, she didn't. I don't think she used it at all. I don't know. Maybe she, maybe she just thought it wasn't really going to be that much of a hard problem. Okay. Like maybe she just, maybe she uh, underestimated their ability to get her. Yeah. So and she is surrounded cocky. at least so that she would have had to do like a weird three, six. Yeah. She's, the end. It, and then that, that last page, there's no way she's, she can yeah. take out one or two, but the others are going to, she's in a, um, a rock and a hard place here. A bit. Um, wearing a very two thousands outfit. Oh, yeah. Well, just wait till her costume gets shredded. <laughs> Any other thoughts on 47 before we move on to 48? No, but I, I will say that I, I like Amanda. I've always liked Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmiotti as artists. Um, I think I first encountered, encountered them when they did. They were doing Power Girl. It might have been oh, in yeah. the JSA comic and not just the Power Girl comic, but I, I Power Girl was the uh, was the character I remember. Amanda Connor from mm-hmm. I remember Jimmy Palmiotti going back into the early '90s when he was inking um, Joe Quesada, you know, on quite a bit from like Valiant Marvel. And he and Palmiotti's been around since like the late '80s on Marvel and early '90s in Marvel, just inking things over and over. So I've always loved his his stuff, and I, I've always liked her. So this it was kind of cool to see this. Um, they're a good match for Terry Moore. And they're yeah. a good match for the tone that Terry Moore uses in yeah. this because it's 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 dangerous, but it's fun. Yep. And that's what I'm getting out of this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, on to 48. Here's the cover here. We've got a half oracle mask, half backerel symbol slash maybe battering with a red circular background. I'm not sure about mm-hmm. that circle, but it could be if it's in line with this beginning, maybe representing Madison and her power, the chaotic code, maybe. I, I do have to show you this. So I, I have it on DC Infinite. And when you get to the last page of each, each issue on DC Infinite, it's an ad for various Birds of Prey trades, including um, by Gail that Simone? illustration, the Gail Simone run, with that illustration by Ed Bennis. Oh, there you go. Um, I don't, that's, it's, it's funny. Like, I don't remember Barbara's breast ever being that buxom. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like, it's like, and, and she's got one button in on that. It's, it's very, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not Jim Balin, but you know, or yeah. Balin, but it's, it's still, it's just crazy. Cause like with Canary, I'm like, okay. And then Hunt, I never liked the midriff bearing Hunter's costume either, by the way. Um, it just seems so unnecessary. Sure. Well, <laughs> got to sex them up somehow. Anyway, but yeah, yeah. I always like the the one that Helena was wearing like in the nineties, like the around like no man's land and stuff like that. That or before that, you know, the it's just the purple and the black under yeah. it just 
you know, I was thought that was really cool. I like that character too. Oh, finally. I think we've had discussions, yeah. but this, yeah, we've got a <clears throat> full bodied Barbara Gordon pose. This is probably when she has thrown herself out of the window. So there's yes. the broken glass and everything and Madison hanging on. Uh, not really sure what's going to happen since she's not connected yeah. to a line, but very action oriented, giving that to Barbara, which I think is, is great. And something we've n- probably not seen with the exception of birds of prey number eight with mm-hmm. Barbara before. So very cool there. Yeah. It's a really cool cover. It's hard for me to choose between this and the next one. Cause I really like the drama that's on the next one. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really do. I really do like this, the, the bat girl. And I think that's a bat girl and Oracle symbol behind them. Mm-hmm. I like the fact that she, you know, she's, she is looking down. It's just very, it's very well, well composed. And the, the fear on Madison's, you know, yeah. eyes and stuff. It's, it's a really, really cool. This is a, this is one of those, you know, you'll notice this on the stand type of covers. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Another, I I'm, I'm getting really sort of nitpicky on some of these things here, but she, she is going crazy with a lot of these uh, action mm-hmm. moves. She is loving it. So I really feel lots of back roll as um, Barbara Gordon, yeah, uh, which is great. But I also feel like she was just healed. Shouldn't her legs be really weak and difficult to control? But she seems to be doing okay. Are you? We're just going with it. You think we're just going? I I think I honestly think it's like it's whatever Marison's powers are. It's almost like an overcorrection or it's okay. something, and then that's why the crash is so huge. Yeah. So. Because her the senator was like, I feel younger than ever. And it's oh, I think true, honestly, yeah. it just shot through. So there's a lot of adrenaline pumping. Yeah. And it's not like she's been, you know, she's been her legs might be weak to a certain extent. And those first few moves before she does the split kick on page five, she's got her legs tucked as if they had just come out of the wheelchair. So she's almost using mostly her arm strength there mm-hmm. so that does sure. the batarang came out the, the grappling hook or whatever it came out and then she pulls herself up so she's she's actually going on instinct because she hasn't had the use of her legs and it's not until she's in a position where she starts kicking and then running so it's not like she stood up and started running at everybody i thought that was yeah. pretty cool and it establishes the fact that there's some sort of line hanging there so when they jump out the window yes. she has it because that was for a split second. I was like, when I was reading through it, I had to go back. I was like, where did they get the battery from? Yeah. It's like back in the day when like you'd see Spider-Man swinging across and you're just like, where is that connected to Peter? Yeah. Like, you know, Batman has a few t- uh, panels of that here and there, especially the Norm Brayfogle era, which I love, but there are some panels where I'm like, where are you swinging from? <laughs> <laughs> He's just levitating. I've been right in. Like Dua Lipa. Yeah, for sure. I, I love it. I think, just the joy, the unadulterated mm-hmm. joy on her face, I think really just brings yeah. it back. And and that's absolutely, I think, what someone would feel if, if they if they were to get back something that they had lost. And I think the joy of also saving someone and being like that uh, in charge of your agency mm-hmm. and in control, whereas normally she's been behind the computer and Donna's been the one in the field. So it's a nice role mm-hmm. reversal. Don is not necessarily leading anything, but she's kind of off, you know, on the side. She's benched a bit because she's kind of trapped in there and, and Barbara is really in control of this. So it's very cool. I did like how, because when she was doing all this, I thought, man alive, is no one going to question how you're doing this? But I'm glad that Terry Moore had Atticus say, you know, who are you, Barbara Gordon? Because he had yeah. been watching and like, this is a little unusual that this woman is all of a sudden gets her chaotic code changed, but she leaps into action as if she's done this before. I don't mm-hmm. know if that will carry on with anything, but I mean, he didn't. I have no idea if this guy yeah. shows up at all from here on out. So your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. Where I was reading it, I initially not in the paper run, but someone had said that, and I guess this is really for after 49, that Madison never pops up again. So even though it seems like something could happen, especially with Tali and that letter or mm-hmm. and the roses she left, I guess she doesn't pop up again, but I'll wait and see rather than trust people on the interwebs. So you mentioned the, in your synopsis how you were going back and forth because, of course, the story itself goes back and forth. And I could yeah. ask this for any of these issues, but do you feel like the formatting of the story is fine? Is it is it jarring that it goes back and forth between scenes, Barbara and Dinah and, and what's going on, action and non-action to a certain extent? No, because we've established that they're the two. It's a it's a 
book with two main characters. So each character has their share of the plot and they're both off. They're both off panel. Dinah is involved with the issue. So it's not like it's a solo Babs adventure. She actually is part of the story. So we do need to see where she, we need to see what's going on with her, especially when the press conference, like having her be kidnapped by these guys in the van works really well because when the press conference goes, you know, FUBAR, you want to know where Dinah is. Mm -hmm. It's like, why isn't she busting in with the canary cry? It's like, Oh, she's being held hostage. So that, that, adds to that you know, yeah. that that provides a realism and then you know just like i said just like a really good episode of television you have a few minutes of this and then you cut back to and here's where barbara is and here's there and so you have and you might have a, um, a commercial in between somewhere but yeah the um it's it's well edited mm-hmm. if this were if this were a show it would have been very well edited yeah and it's really interesting how different it is in the, the fact that barbara and dinah are really not in contact with one another or no communication so leading up to this yeah that's just something that's been very consistent unless they're just in a no radio zone or radio silent situation but here mm-hmm. they've been trying but it's just failed and so the scenes are separate they're in different things there's one i do like how the i don't know if it's this one oh it must be where the plane that barbara is in passes over where the truck is which i thought it was pretty interesting I'm pretty sure it was this one. Yes. Um, And it's just like a little blink and you miss it situation. I don't know if I'll be able to find it. I'm flipping through. I thought it was near the end before she falls off the bridge. (laughs) (laughs) And I can't find it, but I know the exact panel that you were thinking of. Oh, well. That's okay. Believe us that that exists, that they pass. And it's just really interesting that they're in the same space at one point, but they just can't communicate. So. Okay. Uh, I guess my final on this one is the emotion. D- does Terry Moore, as well as the artist, capture the emotion? I have it on page uh, 1819 of when Barbara mm. realizes that, oh, oh, it's going to wear off and it could be fatal. And then it actually wearing off and her collapsing. How, how do you feel? Is that scene successful? I think it is because it's a it's a progression over several panels. So it's the last three panels on page 18 and she's Mm -hmm. Madison's fallen asleep and she's kind of just looking at her. It's a very sweet sort of look like, you know, she obviously cares for, for this girl. And then all of a sudden, like the, she's hit by a pain and just the the beads of sweat and her looking down. And then when you flip it to the next thing or her, you know, it's just like she's getting progressively weaker over the course of the uh, seven or eight panels on the uh, on the page to the point where she collapses. So it, it's it, I think that's I think that's done very nicely dramatically. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they could have they could have very well had her be like my legs, and then the next panel she's out. But they had her they had her fall down um, progr- uh, gradually over the course of a of a few panels, and that I think that added to the drama. Do you think there's any resentment? I'm I'm just looking at this one panel in the middle there that she actually looks back at Madison as she's sleeping. And it's not like the face looks really angry or anything, but I just wonder, you know, does she ever give a last look of like, oh man, so it's worn off. You did this to me. Or is it just like I think she's starting to put two and two together, but I think she passes out before it really Yeah. She can really express it. Man. She's, it's kind of like an oh my God look sort of like. Like it's shock in a different way. And then yeah. she's out conscious. Like she's unconscious. It's like the last thing she thinks of before she, yeah. she loses consciousness. Which is interesting. She knew all, to a certain extent that was going to happen all along, but I think knowing mm-hmm. and almost understanding are two different things or like experiencing mm-hmm. it. So uh, my last thing is just that this, even though it's not drawn by Terry Moore, just feels like a very Terry Moore drawing that he would make. <laughs> Like I can see Cashew on the back of there or something holding on to that and, and her yeah. face. Yeah. So anything else on 48 before we get to the last issue? No, but I mean, again, it's a great cliffhanger, mm-hmm. so to speak. You know, we got the Babs cliffhanger in yep. issue 47. We get the Dinah one here. And I love the line, will you ever learn it? Timing, timing, timing. He gives her a real, he gives a real wit. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, she's very funny. Yeah. And, and, uh, um, and, and she has a, 
there's an arrogance about her character that's very attractive. You know, yeah. if, 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 you know, like there's something sure. very endearing about how cocky she is throughout yeah. the first couple of issues of this storyline and how she just brash she is. And it's, and it's very endearing as opposed to obnoxious. It's yeah. It's certainly not a guy gardener. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So do you think that three issues was good for this arc then? Do you feel like it's it's well spaced? We didn't have any yeah. extra. It's all good. Okay. Yeah, it's it's not like because you know we're we're right. This is what two thousand two, right? So yeah. we are just on the cusp of like the beginning of the writing for the trade era, mm-hmm. where you're going to start getting like regular six issue storylines and things like that. Because um, I think this is right before Bendis launches Ultimate Spider Man, or am I maybe maybe it already launched by then? I don't remember what year Ultimate Spider Man started, but like to me, that's one of the first like true, mm. like you know, because that was a decompressed storytelling more and more storytelling over the course of his career from series to series has become more and more decompressed. Okay, those first few Strangers in Paradise trades take a lot longer to read than the ones at the end, and like an issue of. Rachel Rising or Serial take a little, don't take very long to read, mm-hmm. at least go on a first read through, you just go through it pretty quickly. So he's he's adapted the times that he's found a nice middle here. It's a it's a good, just tight three episodes. And it's truly a guest spot. You know, you can do something with it, but you gotta put the toys back the way they were. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and nothing really fundamentally changes about them. Mm-hmm. And but it doesn't need to because it's just a really cool, it's like I said, it's like a really cool episode of a show. Yeah. A couple yep. of episodes of the show. In fact, it's probably like one episode if you really think about it. Sure. With a couple of key commercial breaks right in the clip. Yes. Oh, those commercial breaks. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so then our final one, 49. You said it might be your favorite one, but we've got the clock tower behind Atticus, and Atticus mm-hmm. is looming over Barbara, who is on the ground. She's lost the feelings of her legs. And then of course the her wheelchair yeah. is back there as well. And then the contrast there of the the green and the I like the coloring. Yeah, yeah. For um, sure. He, I think they did a good job with this villain character. They made him they they didn't make him slimy mad scientist, Bond mm-hmm. villain mad scientist. That they didn't uh, like you know. So he's a little, but he's a little bit skeezy. He's a little bit of a skeezy uh, Steve Jobs or something. So, <laughs> but I, I like the contrast in color here. I do like the fact that he kept Barbara's hair completely red as usual so there's mm-hmm. that clue uh, it works really well just the normal see of her clothes and her body on the cover it's just a very natural looking mm-hmm. figure like her butt's not popping out you know it's which is it's stupid to say oh the anatomy is all correct but like you know it's it's just it it looks like and he's looming ominously, ominously. So it's a really dramatic cover. That's why I like both of the last two. There, there's, there's appropriate moments of drama yep. in each of them. Speaking of butt shots, I don't know if you noticed, but there were um, many Amanda Connor butt shots, and I was wondering it's what's Amanda up Connor. with that. <laughs> Is it's that Amanda just something Connor. she yeah. does? I, I, I guess I'm not as well versed. She in does. Her. She does. Yeah, she's very good at. It's fun in a way that's not the sort of pervy. Greg Land, oh sure, drawing from porno type of stuff. I mean, it's uh, it's really really good because um, because it, it, it like again it matches the tone. It's 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 silly and cheesecakey in, in in some ways and stuff. That's why like she has a she clearly has a lot of fun with Power Girl. Yeah, when she draws Power Girl later on, um, and she does draw Starfire. I be, I know she was like that. They did the Starfire um, series that was part of the New Fifty Two. Oh, or it was part of the DCU. Yeah. It was like, you know, it was, it was yeah, after I the, so I had, I had a couple of issues with that. I know I, I read the first few issues and then don't remember why I didn't read the rest. Um, Cause I remember enjoying it. I think I just missed a few and whatever, but um, I know Shag liked it. I'm sure he did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I will say I do enjoy battle damaged Dinah. This is Where's so fun. I actually like this sequence because of the fact that, you know, there are certain artists who have worked for DC and or Marvel who were writers who would have shown that and just the splatter of blood, like just that three panels is really good because you get your, your, that's the whole brain fills you in on how gross that is. You don't need to see the head pop off um, on any of them. And it's just like, Oh wow. That is, that is cruel. Yeah. Like, Sometimes it's yeah, I guess that's true of what was it? 
uh, death in the family, the fact that they never really showed the crowbar connecting, but it was no. like your mind fills it in. So it's, it's off panel. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty horrific. Yeah. And th- this is a much gorier take on the spy villain trope of having like the fake tooth. That's a cyanide capsule or something. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like they've got yeah. the, they've got the, the suicide pill in their, in their cheek or whatever. And they, they bite down on it and all of a sudden they're foaming at the mouth. So no, this is like, no, um, they've implanted collars under her skin. It's going to pop our heads off. But are they the so ones gross. doing it though? It doesn't seem like they're in charge of the destroying. No, no. Somebody has, oh, somebody okay. has triggered it. That's what gotcha, I was saying. Gotcha. Somebody triggered okay. this. That's why they're so scared. They're like, Oh my God, they're going to kill us. It seems like the, how, this is a question that I just didn't understand. It seemed like the airplane crash, like cr- it doesn't land well. And no. I know that it needed to make an emergency landing, but it really need to be, didn't really need to crash. It was just being forced down by another plane. Uh, did you have any thoughts on whether or not this made sense, or do you have any insight? Uh, I we didn't there's like see smoke it. coming from it. Yeah, we didn't see it crash. So no. I just thought I, well, um, it would just land on the runway, but it didn't. Yeah. By the way, page three is where you see the bridge. Oh yeah, there it the is plane. with the plane up there. So I was like, yeah. oh, so they're connected, but and no. people and people are standing out watching. I think I think they are they are essentially f- literally forced down yeah. by the other plane. I don't think they're hit with anything. So I would imagine that just the aggressive nature of what looks like a jumbo jet. You know, that's okay. not that's yeah. not a small that's like a yeah, it's a 747 or something. It's a big plane. I think the bigger plane pushing on the other plane. I don't know how the physics work, but I would imagine that it, it, yeah. if if it doesn't that's gonna it's forcing it to the ground. Yeah. And that it that it kind of knocks it out of the air basically. Since Ted's might just be one of those private planes. Yeah, yeah. It's a private jet. Well, I've got a personal question for you as a man. So I'm glad you're on here. Now, as a man, if you had to go tinkle, would you tinkle in such an obviously public area of the road like this? I mean, in front of a billboard, right on the berm, as some no, people like to say. I'd go of off the- into the <laughs> okay. I'd go behind a tree. Man. That's what I'm thinking too. I couldn't believe it. Oh, yeah, and that, that's actually kind of funny because you could have <laughs> still done the you could have still done the the billboard, the bike, Dinah grabbing it, and then another panel of the guy running out of the woods. Yeah. Like zipping yeah. up. Hey, that's my bike. You know, so <laughs> either way, it's either way it works. Yes. It's, it's supposed to be a funny moment. And I like the fact that she leaves a note. Yeah. I like how she says that it will be taken care of. You can collect her tomorrow. Doesn't she say that? Maybe she doesn't. She's a beaut. You can collect her. No worry. She'll be safe. But when you next see her, she's like (laughs) thrown the motorcycle down in order to do. She comes flying over the barbed wire fence and then does the skid across. It's a total boss action move. It is. But I'm like, oh, man, she lied about that to the the guy there for sure. Uh, Oh, yeah, right there. Yes, yeah, on she the does ground. It. She takes about. She scores, and the crowd goes crazy. And the third panel is her, oh, yeah, looking up too. at between Talia's. <laughs> uh, yes, of course, of course. <laughs> oh man, so yeah, we can talk about Talia. So I had thought, like, oh, is this is Talia Al Ghul, just because. Yeah. I guess that's me not knowing too many Talia DC characters, and I thought clearly it must be, but. Did would impression. Babs not have known that this was Talia, and why wouldn't she have said something at the at the press conference? Like, why is I that? would imagine that if she's working for President Luther, it's public knowledge, and it's been so for a while. Okay, and I get the impression, and I unfortunately I didn't read Superman at the time. I think the only I didn't read a lot. I've, I've read Our Worlds at War, which is the oh, yeah. crossover Lex's president at that point. The only other story I remember reading with President Lex was a two-parter between detective and action, I think it was, where Batman and Lois Lane break into the White House to steal the kryptonite, steal a kryptonite ring or something mm-hmm. from or so it, it's it's actually I remember it being a really fun story. I have a feeling that somewhere along the line it's because he was he didn't seize power. He was elected president. You know, so like the le- legitimately elected president so i think those in the justice league who would be alarmed by this had to say like we really our hands are tied 
so you named Talia Al Ghul as your chief of staff or whatever she is. And you just kind of like, there's only so like we have to be aware of her, but there's only, we really can't do anything. We can't arrest her. Mm. Like she's like so so unfortunately he's he's skating around the legality, you know, that you know, these are awful people, but they get away with it because of, of the position. <laughs> sure. Which has never happened in government. In no, 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 it hasn't. No. Oh, you kind of have a panty shot. I don't think I can show it, but you can kind of see the panties. It's a garter. But anyway, well, there's a garter, yes, but then you can see the panties. You can see it. Okay, anyway, that's fine. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, you can. Jeez. I White did like panties that. panties with black garters, though? Yeah. I mean, I, oh, wow. That? Tom. Tom, Tom, Tom. Anyways, I did like that fight scene. I, I don't know if I've ever seen Dinah versus Tali. I'm sure I have. Was she in that? With the Ubu, that was Bane. I don't know. But, I mean, those two seem pretty evenly matched. But I would Mm -hmm. also say maybe Dinah would be a bit more skilled in the martial arts. Well, she, uh, I don't know. Well, I don't know if the League of Assassins thing applies in the comics. I know it's been to movies and television with with Ross al Ghul and Talia al Ghul. But I would imagine that she's a, she's kind of like a, like in the the 70s and 80s and whatever. And she's kind of like a Bond girl. But like one of the, one of the Bond girls, like, like one of the more skillful Almost like Spy Who Loved Me type. And we're talking about uh, Talia, right? Talia, yeah. Okay. So she's like, you know, she's like the 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 killer Bond girl, you know. Yeah. So so I would imagine that she's and she's been working for her father for so many years. She's pretty. She's like I would. I'm not saying she's like Lady Shiva level. Yeah. But she's definitely up there in terms of her skills. She can probably take on somebody like Talia, but like Dinah, and yeah. they're they're fighting to a near standstill. They have to get. Yeah. They have to get really down and dirty sure do. <laughs> on page 16 they're like they're basically she's shoving her face into the grass i mean that's yeah. how dirty they have to fight for somebody to get the upper hand and that 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 makes sense to me yeah probably top five top five yeah, fighter a, you think i would say she a female fighter you know or, or fighter overall yeah she's definitely definitely in the top five top ten and, and then these are so these yep. two are evenly matched yeah it's yes, a good fight too. for sure yes so again she gets to oh so it's a nice you call it a framing structure i call it a ring composition but the story starts off with dyna fighting and it ends with dyna fighting so that mm. works well and we also see that madison not only has uh, this chaotic code is not only defensive or perhaps passive but active as well which i'm surprised that tall i mean they're not going to kill off talia al ghul but no. i'm just surprised that she did not die with this electrocution or whatever happened because atticus lost his hands which is pretty <laughs> vicious so that was um, that was pretty interesting, but it is kind of comical to see this. It's like a it's Looney very, Tunes situation. It is very Looney Tunes. <laughs> I can hear the the little blink blink noise when she's like blinking her eyes, and yeah. she's like, you know, yeah, Maybe it's, all the it's, uh, she's been roasted like Dabby Duck, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do you? I, I love the fact that Dinah just goes. Up. <laughs> with oh, her yeah. finger on the bottom of eighteen, she's like, and "Well, you're no funny anymore." Her she her just over. knocks her over. Yeah. Oh boy. How do you feel or how should Barbara feel? Do you feel affronted for her that she is slung over the gas tank of the motorcycle, like a sack of potatoes? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> she hates it. I bet she does. I hear Dia, like she, the, the, so um, it, it's, it's, it makes for a good comedy because of all the, all the, um, the air balloon uh, yeah. Lord balloons around it. They're all fighting, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, it works because it's just, it's supposed to be a funny, yeah. um, funny drive away. So yeah. I like that. She says, when I get back on my own wheels again, you are so toast. So it's probably yeah. true. I don't know when her foot was bandaged. I also wonder when she lost her shoe, but I, I'll believe it. Uh, but that was a, that was a fun detail. The final question about Barbara. Oh, and that scene just like smells of Terry Moore. And I could totally see a bunch of Casey <laughs> Bean with, you know, there and Kachi. Casey, and Francine, and Kachu. Yeah. Driving. Yeah. We have to talk about Barbara's hairstyle because my chief hairstyle and clothing correspondent, Professor Allen, always likes to talk about that. Do you like her hairstyle throughout this story? The weird barrettes there, like something out of Drew Barrymore were really <laughs> bugging me. It was very really? true. It was like, yeah, I was like, what is this hairstyle? So but no barrettes. Yeah, once once it's it's they're they're on there for the first couple of issues, they've fallen out by the end. Okay. Um, you can see one in the butt shot on the plane. 
I bet. Uh, on page nine, you can see it on her left hand side. But I think, but I like the fact that they've fallen out of her hair by the time um, the issue's over because she's been knocked around a little bit. Um, but yeah, but the but after that, with her hair just kind of being the way it is, I have to. It's uh, it's fine. <laughs> Well, gee, no. Well, this I at first I thought, oh, my gosh, she turned into a punk walker at the end. She's got that black heart, heart, broken heart shirt, and it's up and spiked. That one doesn't seem as Barbara E to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, put a put a nose ring in and maybe she's about to go to a club and undercover. I, but all the other hairstyle like her, the bob is like that's kind of it, a classic. Barbara it's it's vocal. it's pulled back. Yeah. It's not spiky. It's it's pulled back, and I think it's just kind of in a in a. Her hair is too short for a true ponytail, so it's in kind of a pom pom on the back of her head, which is being kind of squished by her wheelchair anyway. So, and then she's got kind of the 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 strands going, which is very comic booky. How many women in comic books have these strand of hair falling in front of the face? Nineties. I was just watching yeah. Scream Two, and one of the characters. I'm like, why? Why do you have these tendrils down here? Are they not annoying to you? But I guess that's that yeah, was ninety seven. So I guess that's just it. Yeah, it's a time. It's, it's something of the yeah, time. Yeah, for sure. Any other thoughts on this particular issue? Would you be interested? How about? Sorry, I cut you off. But hmm. would you be interested in seeing more of Madison? Like, does that intrigue you? That ending? A little bit, but only if Terry Moore were staying on it because I can see some other writer getting seeing this getting a birds of prey run and all of a sudden she comes back as like Mm. siren strike with a Y then is like killing people or something (laughs) I see like you know I can see the sort of heel turn of like you know um you know like and and a really bad costume. I mean, maybe I read too many bad books in the early nineties, but like, you know, so there's, there are so many, there there are ways in which this could go really, really foul. If you think somebody else picked up this thread. So the fact that it's a a one and done storyline is, is, is fine. Yeah, for sure. Any other thoughts on 49 before I guess we look at the whole story and give it a rating? No, no, I, I really, uh, just kind of flipping through it. Um, the best part of it is the Talia Black Canary fight. They give like three or four pages to that. It's a really yeah. good fight. <laughs> Which I'm glad. Yeah, I would say that as well as Barbara kicking butt inside mm-hmm. of the the building mm-hmm. and just like seeing her reclaim, I think, her legs and and the back row legacy is, is yeah. really special. I like the I do like the bit with the plane and the and the and the catering cart, the flight attendant cart on the uh, fire ext- with the fire extinguisher. Oh, yeah. Because, Which I think, yeah, she should have known it was going to happen. But yeah, I think she happen. just, I think she just got a little overconfident there. And didn't realize how high up off the ground the plane's wing was because yeah. she goes tippy tumbles over, and I'm amazed she doesn't have a concussion. <laughs> it's For like, sure, how are yeah. you conscious? Yeah, <laughs> you know, how and did that, you just go <laughs> smack against the pavement and just, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, it that probably would have been where she lost her shoe. So I don't know where she lost it, but she has both shoes on there. And there was this, I I hesitate to call it a game, but at governor school, which I went to uh, during high school, I went part-time to governor school, which was science Mm -hmm. and mathematics, and then came over to my home school for the, the social sciences. There was this program called vector jockey, and it was all about, it did not make sense until you were in physics, but you had this like little plane and well really it was like a spaceship and only a certain amount of fuel and you had to get some places by using vectors because you of course are in space so you're like using the propulsion to help you but that's what it reminded me of using Mm -hmm. that propulsion to push it backwards well out of 10 i guess your final thoughts and then out of 10 what chaotic codes do you want to do chaotic sure how how would you rate 47 48 and 49 as a a whole story as a whole story This is pretty high because it's a, I'd say, I'd say a nine because honestly, I don't know. I don't know if like in the greater context of birds of prey, if this matches up with everything else Mm -hmm. as a standalone. So that's why I'm kind of knocking it down a point because I'm not as up on my, this is honestly, I think these are the first three issues I've ever read unless it ever crossed over with a Batman book at one point in the 90s so i'm like okay so maybe it might not be the best representation so i'm kind of holding that point but um as a three issue story arc yeah like i said this is a really tight it reminds me of a really tight fun hour of an action adventure television show from around this time and 
like Elias or something. And I, yeah. that's why I really, really liked it. Yeah, I I would agree with you. I think, you know, I still have some potential questions um, about the chaotic code and, and Barbara and everything. Yeah. I would probably give this an 8.5, but it carries on the tone. I think that Chuck Dixon had set out with Birds of Prey that there are some lighthearted moments as well. But then there are some it's it could be a serious story as well. I'm sad that Barbara and Dinah are really separated on this mission until the end that they come together. But I think that also makes it a unique story and that they have been for several issues several arcs they've been pretty close in contact with one another so this is like Mm -hmm. oh what's it like when they're actually on the same mission but they're separated Mm -hmm. and don't know that they're on the same mission so i think there are um, some unique things and and terry i think captures this the spirit of birds of prey so 8.5 out of 10 chaotic codes (laughs) okay so before we take a break i just have two listener emails that came to me mail time Here's the mail, it never fails. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it comes, I want to wail. First is from Shana. Now, Shana used a swears word. So I shall say the swears word, but it shall be bleeped in the podcast. Okay, so Tom, don't be alarmed. Okay, so. Hi, Stella. I just want to email and say thank you for all the work you put into Back of the Oracle. I recently discovered your podcast this last year and pretty much lost my knowing that there was such a high quality, I know, (laughs) consistent podcast focused on my favorite comic book character. I've listened to many of your past episodes and I've enjoyed following you in real time. Your love for Barbara Gordon, your choice in guests and interview skills. Look, Tom, she's praising you. All make for such an amazing listening experience. I'm a huge fan of podcasts and talk radio, also Latin and the classics, and you really have created something I enjoy from multiple angles. It might might not mean much coming from a stranger on the internet, but your podcast has meant so much to me as it has provided so much entertainment and joy for me over the last year. Thank you. I can't wait for you to get to Gail Simone's Birds of Prey run. I am a huge fan of both her BOP run and her Batgirl run, and so I'm very curious to hear your opinions, and I am excited to follow along with Batgirls in real time with you. Thank you again. And I hope you have a great start to your new year. All the best, Shana. And I have to say that I, I told Shana, I emailed her back thanking her for that, which I really mean. I'm I'm glad. I mean, my hope, of course, is that my podcast, you know, entertains, brings joy, brings escapism and, and teaching as well. But I this I probably should just be best friends with that person. If she, you know, you've got the back girl, you've got the Latin, got the classics. That's best friends right there. So anyways, thank you so much for writing to me, Shana. And then we've got Ian Prime, a.k.a. Ian Miller. He says, Dear Stella and Carolyn knows. Very sorry to hear about Carolyn's health issues and hope that things improve. I greatly enjoyed the retrospective on the Birds of Prey by Dixon Run ending, the examination of the old and new issues, particularly Batgirls. I'm very glad that it got some high cup nudes ratings from you. I also quite enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to the next issue eagerly. Ian. So there you go. Yeah. And we'll see what issue number two has to has to offer. I do need to I ask Mr. Dixon if he will come back on so I can talk about his run as a whole now that we're we're done. And also when Shag was on there, I don't know if you've listened to that, but Shag was bringing up some good points of like that was a weird arc for or storage for Chuck to end on. So what was going on Mm. with that? Did he leave of his own accord or not? So I'll have to get him back on here. But who was writing Nightwing around this time? Was it still him or was it Devin Grayson yet? It's Devin now. It was Devin. So maybe yeah. he, and he, I think he might, there was a period where he was not writing for DC at all. And this might've been the beginning of it. So I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, if he left of his own volition or if he just kind of was shown the door, if they were like cleaning house at DC at the time or something. What a person to try to clean house of though. Chuck yeah, Dixon I don't know. of all I, people. I, I, I'm not sure because I'm trying to remember what the timing was, especially since editorial changed hands over the course of the few years that you're covering right now. So, yeah. yeah I don't know not that I, I'm not criticizing you for that idea. I'm just saying like, if that's true, 
Chuck Dixon of all people yeah, to be like, hey, we're going to get rid of you. That'd be crazy. Yeah, I don't know. So I don't know. I don't know if it was contract was up or what. Yeah. You know? So, but yeah, it does seem Hopefully like I'll this dovetails out. him leaving Birds of Prey dovetails with him possibly leaving the other books yeah. he was writing. Nightwing. So. so okay. Well, Tom and I are going to take a break, and then when we come back, we will cover one modern quickie, which is Nightwing, and then a full review of Batgirl's number two. But first, we have Zias's Radio Hour featuring. <gasps> Locking Up the Sun by Poets of the Fall. Okay, welcome back. Part two of two. We are going to look at Nightwing. Just go through it quickly as I normally do and chat about some stuff that happens and then spend the bulk of our time on back rolls number two. And I will say that Barbara doesn't appear in Batman 119 or Urban Legends. But if you are a fan of Maps Mizuguchi, if you remember her from Gotham Academy, there is an amazing backup of her in Batman 119. And I think it's maybe going to be a six 
part story or so. So I would just suggest reading that. But yeah, let's talk about Nightwing 88. So this is Get Grace in Act 2. Writer Tom Taylor, artist Bruno Redondo, and colorist Adriano Lucas. The synopsis from the publisher, the blue stripes are back. Nightwing gets an updated suit starting this issue. Meanwhile, after the distressing events of rescuing Haley, aka Batwing, Bitewing, sorry, from getting dognapped by bad guys, Nightwing discovers there are way more hits on Dick Grayson than he realized thanks to going public about his fortune, and he needs to find a clever way to be Dick Grayson and Nightwing at the same time. Meanwhile, Heartless tries to buy power away from Blockbuster in order to take control of Blue Haven, and both of these big bads have Nightwing in their crosshairs. So remember, I don't do a review of this, but the, it's just an amazing book. It's probably one of my fa- I mean, I would say it's my favorite, you know, back rolls. I think that sounds like a betrayal. So I would say now, you know, back rolls is, is tied with it, but it's certainly something that has given me ha- hope and a renewed faith in DC comics. But what, before I even start this, what has your experience been of this current era, this Tom Taylor era, I guess I'll say of Nightwing. <laughs> I hadn't been reading Nightwing. Heartless, by the way, is the guy with the weird mask toward the end of the issue. Yes. Okay. All right. Just trying to remember who that was. I started reading comics with Robin and Nightwing. Mm-hmm. So I read with New Titans 71. So I followed, and I read back back issues. So I followed the evolution of Dick Grayson all the way through. I want to say like Nightwing 100 was probably my last issue of that series. In here and there, through the end of the series, and Marv Wolfman has been writing it at one point. Jane Jurgens was doing a run on it. I like again, Infinite Crisis came around. I, I got right back into it for a little while. I read the New Fifty Two for a handful of issues, but it was not terrible. I was just bored with it, so I, I dipped out of that. And then I hadn't read anything about Nightwing until I saw the solicit for this right around the Future State event they did because i hadn't been paying attention to anything in dc continuity i had no idea what all this metal and all this <laughs> stuff was but i saw the artwork on this yeah and i saw some people on twitter tweeting out like panels and pictures and stuff and, and 78 hadn't come I, issue 78 i think is when the run started it didn't come out yet i was like i should check this out so i put it on my poll list and i'm really glad i did this this is such a great run of this character and it's serious and it's 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 the closest it it reminds me a lot of that first chuck dixon um scott mcdaniel run from like you know that that really really great run they had at the beginning of that title i mean it's 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 it, it it's serious but it's a lot of fun and it's not overly grim dark and it's not the art is gorgeous and it really fits the character and I like the characterization and everything. It's just, it's, it, it, it's one of like, am I buying any, oh, I'm buying a couple of other DC comics, but it's like, it's like my favorite of the, of the like three or four DC titles I'm buying right now. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. So, yeah. And this is a, this is a great issue because it, out of nowhere, <laughs> Titans. Appear. I know Titans. Appear. Yeah, I'll get point. to that <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So in the beginning, of course, they're talking about there's some hits Mm. on Dick Grayson. And then you also see Barbara and she's talking to somebody, which I assume by the end that it's probably Wally. She seems to be in communication. um, Yeah, I think I think uh, I think it's Wally. That panel that you had with Blockbuster, that guy and the woman that they send to put the hit on him. Yeah. They're a, I want to say they're a Chuck Dixon creation. Okay. Uh, they first appear in the late, the mid to late nineties in, I want to say his detective comics run. And I was like, and when I saw her, I was like, wait, are these, these two, they're like this pair of assassins who are in love and, yeah. and it's kind of like a pumpkin and honey bunny thing. And they were, it was, it was a comical little bit. And they, they took on Batman at one point. I think there was an, ep- there was, it was a storyline where also like, Deathstroke was involved like right after. So it was like 96, 97, right after Deathstroke's uh, can- series had been canceled. Um, first series had been canceled. So it was pretty cool that they're bringing, because this is a, pre- um, I don't know when the last, granted, it's been so long since I read Nightwing consistently. They might, mm-hmm. or Batman consistently, they might have shown up in other po- points. But to me, this is a pretty deep cut to bring yeah, these two in. For sure. 
I would so agree. Yeah, that's a pretty mummy. that's pretty cool that they, yeah. they dug those two out of mothballs, you know, just just to have this mission. And it makes sense because they're 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 snipers. Absolutely. It, it this happens to me in real life for some reason, but sometimes the modern stuff that I'm reading really coordinates well with the vintage stuff that I'm reading. And I've noticed in the vintage that Barbara seems to go to Wally a great deal whenever there's something, some issue, or Dick is going through a hard time to try to get Wally mm-hmm. to talk to him. And so here it like makes sense that Wally is is the one yeah. to be talking to her here and then rescue him or catch him and uh, cradle him yeah. or, or piggyback him later on. So I feel like they're probably best friends. I even asked uh, Don, would you say that probably they're that is his best friend. So it's that. he and Wally have a very good relationship with one another and they've always been very good friends. It's not the sort of weird adversarial yet friendly relationship he has with Roy. Mm. You know, the two of them get along really well, but I think Dick and Wally feel more, have more of a friendship. The only other person I could picture being closer than Wally would be Donna. I would agree. Yeah. And I don't have your Titans history, but w- from but, what I've yeah, read, that's both, what I would they say. They both, they both work. And I don't know what the characterization is in this era of, you know, things change, but in my history, it's either Wally and Donna really, really. Yeah, for um, sure. This is, uh, I, I just love the scenes with Barbara. I mean, of course, objectively or biasly, I, you know, I love the shipping, but I just feel like it's done well. I mean, for several years, we've just had unnecessary drama between these two, but Mm -hmm. it's like, we, we finally seem to have hit like a good climate of the relationship. It just is like, it's working well, they're friends, but also they're lovers Mm -hmm. and there's like no unnecessary drama. So I'm just very appreciative of their interactions and that it's fun. It can also be serious. You can care for him and be worried about him and vice versa. And it all works out. This is really cutely drawn too. Yeah. She like it's so it's not na- like the the facial expressions are natural and it's it, the little my hero thing. It's really yes. cute. Uh, I like the fact that he's getting the bagels from Tomasi's Deli, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, but it's just like um, I like it when an artist we talked about Phil Noto and his covers. I like it when an artist in comics has a really good control of characters faces. Mm hmm. And isn't just drawing the same face or does really good facial expressions on the characters like like Kevin Maguire, for instance. Right. Like, you know, like just the facial and Keith Giffen would do and George Perez and and, and you know, you have Phil Noto here. Amanda Connor did some great f- facial expressions in the thing we had like here. There there's some, something very, very natural about the way these uh, Bruno Redondo. Or no, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Bruno Rodriguez right, does yeah. the does the does the facial expressions of these Absolutely. characters. And, uh, um, oh, there's Gun so, Bunny. Yeah. Uh, so then, of course, he's at this press conference, and he's about to get shot. Oh boy, look who shows up with my nemesis, Starfire. But what's really funny is I love this. I wish that they still used icicles, icicle word bubbles, <laughs> but they don't. But at one point, Starfire says, Oracle, we have a shooter. Is the feed working? Can you see? And the next one is, I can see the Starfire. Starfire. Now, oh, now, I am going to say this. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tug at that rug that you're sitting on. <laughs> okay. The Oracle, Gun Bunny, Starfire, Gun Hawk, their flash on the next page. Uh, they're all bold italicized. They're all italicized. They're they're all bold and slightly italicized in terms oh. of the typeface. It's kind of like back in the day in the trend. You see, I don't know if you read old Transformers comics from Marvel, but anytime they use a character's name, it would be bold and italics. Like oh, interesting. You know, okay. so they were. It was a, so. I think it's just a very comic tropey, like you know, so I these, see. you know, um, or but but I I'll, I'll give it to you. You no, no I mean you're right. The evidence does point to that, but seriously, yeah, Starfire. I, star star I yeah. still wish that she had icicles. I mean, I don't yeah. know what their history is in this continuity, but I'm assuming. Yeah. I also like how incognito Babs looks, just with her shades mm-hmm. and everything. But then, yeah, yeah, so we've got the whole the whole Titan crew. Got Wally coming in and rushing, also giving him an option of cradle yeah. or piggyback, which I thought was really fun. I mean, neither are that but, dignified. <laughs> now, let's let's go back to. The Starfire okay. page. Okay. And if you, I don't know if you can zoom all the way out, but on my, on my, um, if you can, is, it looks like it might be, a, yeah, that is a great 
That's a great page. Yeah. Because she turns around, runs, and Donna just grabs the earrings and just I, I like the I like the way their their figures are drawn as well. Um yeah. he, she uh Redondo does not give Starfire like <laughs> the, Over she's in proportion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just stuff like that. Like you notice stuff like that. And, yep. and I like Donna's costume. Um this costume. I'm not that big about the collar, but um, but yeah. the, the stars on the side and everything looks really, really the, cool. But this is a really cool yeah. Her thing. I don't understand kind of the the shoulder pads necessarily, but I do like how casually she is leaning against the building, yeah. just like this. This is pretty easy for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. The we do have a piggyback, which is a lot of fun. Mr. Terrific pops up and then he gets a new suit right there. And um, I love that little. I don't know, Chibli or kind of anime cartoonish style of <laughs> Wally saying, and your face has the, now I need to get out of this because I can't read it. As well. the inbuilt defense yeah. of being too pretty for anyone to shoot at. There you go. Yeah. And and they talk about just the fact that the more flexible material and the bolt proof material is, is vulnerable to stabbing attacks. So they made a point of working around that as well. So he's mm-hmm. getting his suit and now that the stripes go all the way down to, I guess, connect to what his three, the index middle and ring finger. Whereas yeah. originally they were just kind of um, blue flares on the knuckles. So that's kind of the classic where, as they said, the, yeah. the stripes are back. And we've got these uh, these people, and I think that's his sister. And the Titans are here. I mean, did you enjoy this, seeing the Titans like this? Yeah. I mean, it's been a long time since I read a Titans comic. Yeah, it's um, been hard but, for you. But we've got, I mean, page, oh, they don't page number of the pages. <laughs> The Titans Together page, the yeah. the the homage to Teen New Teen Titans number one. I mean, it's yeah, it's total fan service, but yeah. I'm here for it. He's sipping it up like soup. All right, it's it is it's it's total. They're all in the right position, yeah. and um, he, Gar's even changing. It's yeah. you know, uh, it's it's just great. I mean, that's like I said, it's it's total fan service, but I'm I am here for it. Slurping it up like soup. And then, yep, mm-hmm. got some Blockbuster. And then, ooh, Starfire versus Blockbuster. Really <laughs> I don't I don't know what would happen there. And then, yeah, I, Heartless reappears. Oh, yeah. I love the name. I love the line. I have ever, she says, to what, Roland? Like, yeah. that's just. Ooh, yep. That's why I like Corey. She doesn't screw around. That's why <laughs> I hated what they did to her at the beginning of the new 52. Because it was just like, that's not her. But yeah. Corey, Corey, you don't mess with Corey. <laughs> And then you have Gunhawk and Heartless there at the end. Um, Mm -hmm. And I did like all, you know, when Heartless says, is there someone who will miss you? Someone who relies on you? And he says, Bunny, we're everything to each other. And then, well, that's that was the kiss of death right there. So he's probably lost his heart. So goodbye, Gunhawk. Tom Taylor killed you. Uh, And then says next to Superman, Superman. which we've seen some really special issues between Superman and Dick. So Mm -hmm. I can't I can't wait to see what Tom Taylor does with that. But yeah, so we don't need to read that. But just want to go through that and talk about Nightwing. And again, highly recommend this particular run. So now we're moving on to our last thing, which is Batgirls number two. I went to the comic store last weekend. (gasps) And you picked up. And I picked up a bunch of different stuff, including the. I hadn't been in a couple of weeks, so there were like four Spider-Man comics for my kid. Ooh, um, yeah, a bunch of indie stuff, including like Undiscovered Country from Image, which is a really good thing. Department of Truth, which is really good. Uh, Marvel has just relaunched King Conan. Mm. <laughs> for some reason, I bought like a ton of King Conan back issues at the Baltimore Comic Con, so I've been like really into King Conan uh, or Conan the King, depending on what what iteration you're looking at so that was cool and i found both issue one and two still on the stand of batgirl so i grabbed both one and two okay here we go because the batgirls demanded it issue number two one way or another story becky clunan and michael w conrad art george corona and colors sarah stern picking up immediately after issue one the saints and batgirls tussle while babs updates them on the various members and instructs them to get out of there tarsus is the ringleader specializing in torture valentine or valentine 
has a Batman-like origin and sees militarized order as the key to the city's redemption. Assisi worked for Star Labs and has stolen tech to outfit the Saints and is often accompanied by an animal bot. And here we have Fido 5. Babs gives props to the Batgirls while also recognizing the confusion that sharing a name could potentially cause while on comms and says they'll have a meeting to discuss some uh, code names. Mm -hmm. The Batgirls do their best in the engagement, but end up listening to Barbara and getting out of there. The Saints allow it and leave to plan for another attack. The Batgirls reconvene at home, and while Steph is pretty down about all the bad things that have been happening lately, Cass suggests that they take it one step at a time and begin with breakfast. At Our Lady of Mercy, Seer, pretending to be Simon Saint, dresses down the saints for letting the Batgirls go, but they say they won't fail again and are the heralds for Simon Saint's second coming. At the afternoon meeting, Batgirls discuss why the saints believe Simon Saint is still alive, and Babs deduces that it must be Seer. They talk about all the things they have on their plates to do as heroes in a new place, and Barbara warns them to wear their helmets while riding their scooter. Little does she know that they're not riding their scooters, but they're still cruising in Bondo, which they, of course, stole (laughs) or recommissioned. I don't know. Last issue. As they patrol the streets, they see a gathering of perps that they beat up previously. In my notes, I spelled beat B-E-E-T. But anyways, Mm. along with some cops building a Wicker Man-esque structure with stolen goods. Back at the warehouse, Barbara catches Dick up on what's been going on in a nice girlfriend-boyfriend sort of conversation while making earrings when the back girls return and update her on what they saw. Steph also continues saying their neighbor is the serial killer and Babs, for whatever reason, still doesn't listen. Barbara catches up with Cass while making dinner and Steph does something with her phone and hides it, which I still can't understand what she actually does. Grace O'Halloran continues her story on the impromptu street artist tutor while also defending the back rolls and updating readers slash audience members on the clock tower and what happened to it. Barbara shows the girls her solution to the comms issue earrings, but Cass is concerned that she doesn't have pierced ears. Easily remedied in a scene out of parent trap with Lindsay Lohan, Cass now has pierced ears. Batgirls do a field test on the comms while also doing an errand for Barbara. Steph spots the neighbor with a human head, but they don't do it. They don't go to him. They are distracted by a tussle in the alleyway and a zombie construction worker. Worker. The victim, also the owner of the bookstore, Babs told Cass to check out, asks the girls to look out for a crock pot that his wife bought and was stolen. And they say they will, and they run after that construction worker. Later, Tudor is revealed with some sort of chemical agent leading the people of the hill to rise against those who would silence the people and to purify Gotham. Is this January 6th? The Batgirls, having chased the perp in the alley to the gathering, are about to stop Tudor when Steph falls victim to the zombieism. Next, Tudor versus Batgirl versus Batgirl. Okay, lots of things going on here, just like the first issue. I first want to ask some questions about the cover. Mainly, what do you think about the cover? And what do you think about the fact that this issue, as well as the the main cover of issue one, we kind of leave Barbara out of it to a certain extent. We really focus on Steph and Cass. And we do that again here where Barbara is there. She's a floating head, hashtag Carolyn knows, but she's on a screen kind of looking down and judging those back girls. But what do you think about this cover? What do you think is what's the symbolism there? Is there symbolism with Barbara not really being present present? She looks like a worried mother. <laughs> Which is what I I'm concerned about. I don't want her to be a den mother. She can be like the den mother to the I don't want it to be that way. Yeah. I mean, did you get a feel of that in the issue? Do you feel like that she's glor in, in issue one too? Just a glorified den mother that they like check in with every now and again? <laughs> I don't want to be that negative about it, but right now it seems like they want to focus on Cass and Steph. So she is kind of playing that role. Okay. If we didn't know that she was over in Nightwing doing the Oracle thing, um, I don't even know if she's going to suit up at Batgirl again. I have no idea what they're, um, if 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 she wasn't seeing action in Nightwing, I'd be like, oh yeah, they kind of resigned her to this mother yeah, this this den mother role, but she's not Mrs. Garrett. So (laughs) 
Yeah. And I mean, she's still, I don't know, she's playing a Q almost, yeah. a Q and an M at the same time. If mm-hmm. we're, you know, if the, the girls are bonds. So I guess we'll see. I do want her to yeah. be more active, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It seems like Batgirls and Barbara is is what we're seeing here. But otherwise, I mean, the, the covers are fun. I'm enjoying them. I just find it really unusual that we're seeing Barbara but not seeing Barbara. And of course, mm-hmm. below her is the symbol for Seer. So Seer is, is always present. I did want to at least mention, because I mentioned last time that these saints are based off of real life people. So just briefly who they are. So Tarsus, a bit too vague since it is a city. It could be St. Paul, who was originally Saul, because he was born in Tarsus. And he has or is regarded as one of the most important figures of the apostolic age. And we know that he's written or many 14 out of 27 books of the new Testament are attributed to Paul. So that's, that's a, that's a big deal right there. We've got Valentine who's the patron saint of Turney, and that's a city in the Southern portion of Umbria in central Italy, the patron saint of epilepsy and beekeepers as well. Martyred of course. And uh, we've got that Valentine's day, which is based off of this particular person, a CC. Many people know a CC. Several. (laughs) There are several saints associated with that particular town, but given the animal companion, it is most likely Francis Italian Catholic friar deacon and mystic. He founded the, the men's order of friars minor, the women's order of St. Clair and the third (laughs) order of St. Francis in the custody of the Holy land. Uh, Most venerated figure. Even Tom knew, see? Uh, well, I grew up around Catholics. I, oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I, I'm not Catholic, but I, yeah, St. Francis of Assisi is like one of the ones. Him, Thomas Aquinas. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, St. Benedict. Val, you know Valentine because Valentine's Day. Yeah. There's a, few, there's a few that you just know off the top of your head or you know, like St. Anthony, mainly because there's probably a prep school on Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> sure named after yeah, somebody. yeah so there's like you know saint joseph's uh he's of course associated with the patronage of animals and the natural environment which i mm-hmm. appreciate him a great deal and then fido uh-huh. five could just be a dog name i feel like could be referencing um either fidelis of como or fidelis of Sib- Sigmaringen, uh, both of whom were martyred i think the only saint mm-hmm. that wasn't martyred was francis though i think he did get the stigmata so that was um, distinct too. But anyways, there you go. I just wanted to mention those that they're based off of real life saints. Okie dokie. Let's see here. Well, I guess I'll just ask you right away. What do you think of this? You read issue one in preparation for this. And now, of course, yeah. issue two. Oh, how are you feeling? I mean, we did demand it. Fans demanded this. You may not have been one of those mm-hmm. fans. But do you feel like so far this is a worthwhile book? I hope it is for the fans. I honestly I mean, it, it, it was, it had a lot of action in it. Mm-hmm. I can see they're still getting some stuff set up. It has a good cliffhanger. Yep. Um, I don't know who this taskmaster light villain is tutor or whatever. Like, oh, yes. you know, um, yeah, it, it does. It doesn't he look kind of look like taskmaster. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, Let me see. Uh, but I'm hoping that the fans really, really dig it. Um, it's a book that I might, check out when it hits the dc infinite app and not buy the issues off the stands because it was just i mean like i said it was it's pretty well it's really really busy there's a lot going on it's really busy yeah it was you know like you know kind of go back over i'm like oh yeah there were there's a lot that happens (sighs) like i said i'm not really the i'm not really in the best position to judge anything because i'm coming in cold i haven't i've never really read much of like my Stephanie Brown that I know the best is like when she was first introduced 30 years ago, because mm. I had her for like, I, I actually liked her when she first appears as spoiler. I've always liked her as a character Cass, I remember from when I saw her like in Batman or Robin or Nightwing or whatever, like, you know, so I've never actually read their individual titles as yeah. Batgirl. I, I did like, you know, the scenes of them in the apartment and everything, but I, like I said, it, there was, I think she's getting like, I like Becky Cloonan, you know, and I think she's getting, she's getting a good dynamic established, yeah, so it's just, but like I said, I'm like, uh, do I like personally? I'll I'll wait on the yeah, I'll wait for video, so to speak, on it. <laughs> um, but I did, but I I found it enjoyable for the two issues that I that I read. I might, I'm contemplating buying the rest of this arc to see how it 
turns out, especially with the cliffhanger at the end. I'll kind of sure. see like what's going on here. I will say like the more I look at Babs of this issue, I think she's being drawn a little too old. Interesting. Like she, I know she's older than the than right. the the women than the other two young women. Are they supposed to still be teenagers? How old are they supposed to be? I've never been given a number, and okay. I couldn't tell because you know I'm coming in off of uh, the recent Batman stuff. But they yeah. with the detective comics that Tinyan had done, I guess that was mm-hmm. Rebirth or whatever. Uh, I would yeah. assume that they're teen, like might be late teens, but like eighteen, nineteen. I would say so. Yeah, like New Teen Titans age. Yeah. Babs is Babs I isn't thirty. She was. Who knows? Who knows? Because, because she the way she's being down. drawn here. Yeah. Yeah. So she, the way she's being drawn for some of the panels here, she looks like she's in her thirties. Yeah, I feel and like it, maybe it's, it, twenty. That's why I said it. She looks yeah. like a. Yeah, she kind of looks den motherish. She yeah. almost looks like this is going to be a weird thing. She almost looks like the adult aunt or mom character in like like an, an animated cartoon from like Disney or Pixar, like in big hero six or something, like, okay. you know, that's in the show. Sure. It's, but it's kind of cool, you know, like, but isn't really like a main character, but you know, like, you know, and I'm not trying to, and I'm not trying to like knock the art, the art actually, like I said, the art's very, very busy, but it's, uh, yeah, it fits the tone and it, 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 it fits the, it's not trying too hard to do cool, but yeah. So, but perhaps looks a little too old. <laughs> Yeah, which <laughs> might go with, you know, what our our concern, or at least my concern is of what what is her place in this yeah. story and in this trio and everything. Either that, or we're looking at through the eyes of somebody, of a hero, of a pair of superheroes who are 18 or 19, yeah. and anybody over the age of 25 might as well look like they're 30 or 35. No, it's, yeah, no offense true. to 18 or 19 year olds, but yeah. there is a perception of people who are a certain amount of older than you yeah. that they they seem a lot older than, you know. Than yeah. actually and um, even how they're treating her like here with this scene and, and Steph going to Babs automatically for for comfort and Barbara you know checking in with Cass one-on-one and also yeah. saying you know how's your reading going you should go check that bookstore out so she is uh, she's leaning into that if that's mm-hmm. what we want her to do and I think the the girls see her like that as well yeah I will, that that works because if she does see if she is there to help take help help them, take care of them Mm -hmm. if that's the way she knows how to do it then it then it works yeah the the muscled up tech big bad guys there the (laughs) The same kind of funny it's like (laughs) are you okay with the info dumping and eh, how oracle does it i mean it kind of seems oracle-y that she would update them on who it is as well as the readers yeah i how many comic books have you and i read where (laughs) if it's not oracle doing it it's just like Here's the caption box. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I, I don't think it even registered. I'm so I've been so used to it over the yeah. years. So, were you going to um, say something? I cut you off. Those are very big knee pads. They sure are. <laughs> oh man, I do like how I'm going to have to find where this is, but where she actually says, "Oh yeah," so she talks to Cass, and we can tell she's talking to Cass and says, "Back girl, you can handle much, pretty much anyone, but these aren't just any ones. There are three of them, and then and back girl, I know you have enough smarts and heart to survive any situation, but this isn't worth the risk. Also, we really need to sort out code names. So, yeah, I'm glad that you know Barbara as well as the writers recognize that having more than one person with the same name will cause problems, kind of like Ashley in the 2000s or the one year that I taught three Abbeys in the same class, all with different spellings. But have you? What would you say when you were in school is like the most popular girl's name do you remember oh i grew up in the era of the of the jennifer okay mine there's I Ash- like were ashley's yeah um there funny enough in, in one of my classes this year i have uh three katie's a caitlin and a katcha heck yeah are they also, i also <laughs> uh one of the katie's has a c okay. one of the other two have a k okay um caitlin has a k katcha has a k i I had this string of Kathy's in my senior year of high school. <laughs> I had a neighbor, next door neighbor named Catherine, who I had a, we never went out, but um, I had a massive crush on her. I went out with a Kathy for a few weeks. We're still very weeks. <laughs> high school. We, okay. we, we were, we were friends. We tried dating. It ended badly. Oh dear. Okay. We're still friends. It's been 25 years. Oh, that's good. You're still friends. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it was a high school saga. Okay. Um, without getting into deals. And then I went out with a Kate 
whose name was Catherine, but K A T H R Y N. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. a year and a half. Wow. That ended really badly. Oh my god! <laughs> that was a. That was a. Oh. Well, you'll have to tell me all about it over some covfefe sometime. Yeah. I swear, all you got to do, you we, don't need alcohol to loosen Tom's lips. Probably, you just have a podcast. We probably should have um, broken up about like, we probably, long story short, I made, she was, she was younger than I was. Uh-huh. So she was still in high school. I went off to college. We made the mistake of, I made the mistake of saying, hey, let's stay together. Uh, we probably should have broken up maybe six months sooner. We ended up having concert tickets. It was just a oh, whole thing. Oh, no. Yeah. Who was concerts? Was Bruce? Oh, God. It was Hootie and the Blowfish. Hootie and the Blowfish. Oh, Tom. Tom, Tom, Tom. In you retrospective, have- in retrospect, when she said, I'll buy the other ticket off of you, I should have said yes. But I said no. Oh. Uh, because you're going to take the guy you're cheating on me with. Oh, Tom. And so I went to a Hootie and the Blowfish concert with my girlfriend, who was barely talking to me out of spite. Wow. We broke up like a week later. Okay. Did you enjoy the concert? Fair enough. Hootie and the Blowfish were a tight, pretty, were a pretty good concert. They were a pretty tight band. So okay. I think we found worth. what our uh, intro song is going to be. I don't know. I'll pick one from the you Find the Hootie and the Blowfish song? Yes. Oh, great. I'm sure well, I know a good ones. Okay. Just continuing on. This uh, might be my favorite. Yeah. Back page. to the comic I, books. You uh, did that. I did not. I asked you. What was the main name of girls at your, and then it turned into that. So don't blame me, sir. Anyways, I really like the art on this for whatever reason, but I'm loving this art Call it kind of pop rock art, mm-hmm. but just the colors and everything. Um, and I just really like that panel where Cass and Steph are using a zip line. What are those That's called? a cool panel. Yeah, it matches the tone the, of the book really well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I did have a question about why they were using walkie talkies and not comps since clearly it didn't work, but it is answered. So I'm glad that a lot of questions I have are answered within the book. So the reason is, well, Seer could probably hack it. Um, so mm-hmm. that makes sense. Well, let's see here. Uh, Our Lady of Mercy, the fact that it's the oldest church in the hill, it's condemned. And now it's a straight up hive of scum, skull. No, it does say scum, scum and villainy. And villainy. <laughs> and and they apparently uh, who for some reason aren't worried about asbestos, but it just, I feel like it's a callback to that politics and Gotham discussion I did with Sam Heath about the fact that re- religion doesn't really play a part in Gotham citizens' lives. And it's often pot- potentially a negative connotation or just like no connotation. So of course we have the saints and then we have this dilapidated church that's used for, you know that whatever this thing is but that this gathering here so that's just very interesting so the media continues to be which we have grace o'halloran as one of our side characters or minor characters so the media is still kind of the religion in, in gotham citizens lives i would agree with you that you called it busy like there's a lot going on carolyn and i yeah. broke it down because you have seer you have the saints you have whatever these zombified people are and then you had tutor so at least now we we see that Tudor and the zombified people are associated with one another, but you still have Seer. And, and so those two aren't necessarily connected. And then, of course, the serial killer, which seems to be it's supposed to be like a joke now, maybe because I'm super confused why Barbara consistently doesn't listen to Steph when she's saying that guy is a serial killer. She like walks off at one point and says, why doesn't anyone listen to me? And they see a human head. Yeah. See the grumpy one with the face of 1000 corpses. It's like yeah. nobody ever listens when I talk and it's true. Barbara's not listening. And then Cass sees the human head and then they're like, oh, there's a disturbance. So I don't know what that's about. I guess it's now just a running joke, but it's a joke that creates a mischaracterization of some of these people. Well, Stephanie, I'm so used to everybody blowing Stephanie off anyway <laughs> from like the like from the minute that she was a character that, you know, <laughs> makes sense for you. Well, I felt like I would say that's true of that era. I don't know, pre new 52, but I felt like now with rebirth that she was given more respect as spoiler mm. because those tales were darker, but I mean okay. maybe we are getting back to that. You might be right. Might perhaps we're just getting back to that characterization either that or this is going to lead into some sort of storyline where she has to take on the serial killer yeah or she's going to try there's it's it, it may it's it's like a it's like a breadcrumb they're dropping for a later yeah later issue, perhaps and i could see at the very end steph like saying victory see i was right all along <laughs> and then yeah. She, she, yeah like yeah we should have listened to you 
I will say that seer is now given a they pronoun, which they were using she consistently, but in this issue, they use they. So we're still not sure who this person is. The guests from Carolyn and I, uh, maybe Wendy, Wendy Harris. Mm. Not sure. Bab still thinks they're using the scooters, which is cute, but she's a fool because, of course, they're using Bondo. And <laughs> I will say I did love that scene where Cass is just straight up chilling, chilling like a villain with those shades on and in Bondo, which I find really amusing. And they got dice and a Batman hanging over there. I don't trust any either of those girls driving. Well, it's Cass consistently is the one driving. I don't trust her to drive, but there we go. <laughs> Um, I liked the phone call with Dick still continuing again, just, I, I think a good relationship. And then Kat, uh, Babs mentioning Cass's reading ability is very interesting. So I'll, I look forward to seeing what that is. Here's a question. Now I mentioned Lindsay Lohan and Parent Trap. I don't know if you've ever seen that film. I enjoy it. Um, I'm familiar with the original with Haley Mills. Okay. Do you, well, I don't know if they had that particular scene. It's been a while since I've seen that one. But what do you think about this ear pierce scene or just the piercing scene with Cassandra? And then do you like the earrings as an idea for communications? I like the earrings. Uh, There's something very Wonder Woman about it. (laughs) It doesn't it seem like very. I think Don actually think Wonder Girl had communicated earrings at one yeah. point so yeah it's very it's class it's a classic it, it it's with the tone of the, the totally it fits very very well yeah uh with the with the, with the stuff i almost wanted um, an apple to be there i yeah. guess they use an ice cube and uh a mm-hmm. needle and everything, yeah the ice cube and needle bit yeah i've always been told to have an apple in the back so i guess it you know the needle has somewhere mm-hmm. to stab there was did you know what Steph was doing with I'm gonna to have to find this now. This phone sequence. I wonder if she's I taking it. a selfie. Okay, but who, I want to see she was sent because it says sent. It says spellbound gallery. Huh. Thank you. I was gonna um that. I don't know what that is. Okay. I, unless I, unless yeah. it's supposed to be like I don't know why I would say sent if she was posting like to Insta or something, hmm. but Cass clearly interrupted her taking a selfie. Yeah. And I feel like maybe they're not supposed to. I don't think they're supposed to be doing that. No. The technology, number one, as well as they're supposed to be keeping a low profile. Yeah. Yeah. So being out on so, line, So that might be why. Just yeah. And I. Th- yeah. yeah. So. Okay. I think. I mean, I think that's all I have. Of course, now we've got to figure out what's going on with Tudor. And who this is. Originally, I thought Tudor was just a, a street artist, but there's something else going on. Um, mm-hmm. And now we've got some politics going on with it. But and of course, Steph is zombified. But any other thoughts on this issue? The zombified thing looks interesting. I it It's very classic, like one team member is brainwashed. The other one's yeah. got to figure all this out. Yeah, yeah it works. Enough to see, like, okay, what what are we what are we going to? How are we purifying Gotham <laughs> politically? Yeah, well, this is are thing, you getting like, the I, January sixth feel out of this? A little bit, be, okay, li- okay, a little bit. It's also got this sort of like I don't remember from if you've ever read or remember it was a storyline back in like eighty eight, eighty nine called the Cult. Oh, where yeah. uh, mm-hmm. you have Deacon Deacon Blackfire, I think was mm-hmm. the guy's name, and he was he was forming this cult around all these homeless and dispossessed people. I don't know what the state of Gotham City is. I haven't read Batman in about twenty years, so I don't know if, if Gotham is supposed to be like a complete hellhole at mm-hmm. the moment, or if it's or if it's got like really nice districts and then really bad kind of things. Um, because like with the with the with the kind of the. De- condemned cathedral the condemned church makes sense in a sort of bronx in the 1970s sort of way you know where like you had all these kind of condemned blown out buildings that weren't getting torn down because new york city was like completely out of money and people were actually living in there and some people were trying to like there were neighborhood improvement associations trying to fix them up um so people could actually live like through the 70s and the early 80s most of the 80s in new york and i don't know if they're still pulling from that for gotham city because on batwoman they're clearly using chicago okay yeah the, a lot of the establishing shots of batwoman are chicago okay. <laughs> um but they are they have like you know and every city's got its seedy side um it's just that gotham's always seemed a little bit more rough than others yeah. and bloodhaven is even worse 
<laughs> but um, so I don't know if they're just kind of like, you know, picking up if he's doing kind of that Deacon Blackfire thing, where he's picking up all the picking up who he can. And then it's just kind of spreading to, to whomever is, is there. Yeah. The Hill. It, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see what's behind this. It mm-hmm. would be really interesting. I don't, I, the poli- by having a, an obvious mind control thing, mm-hmm. um, you have a villain, you have a quick story that you can do in the six issues. It would have been really interesting to have a bat family hero face off against a group like this that is not being specifically mind controlled through some sort of power, but they've just been brainwashed via the internet, like QAnon type of stuff. It would be really interesting to see them have to handle something that's been done without some sort of like, you know, tech gadget power yeah. hypnosis type of or thing. But I don't, I think that would take longer. Yeah, have to build that story for a long, for a while, for it to really feel um, feel natural. And you, yeah, this is an establishing story for a title, so you don't want to do that with this. Yeah, and it probably would have been Steph too, since she was the one who's down on herself. So you know, how yeah. could this guy reach her? I, I kind of wish that this wouldn't be happening right now. I, I wish that they would have maybe sowed the seeds a bit more of this tutor. I mean, mm. we saw his art and everything, but all of a sudden we saw the art. There was that uh, Grace was talking about it and then bam, now we've got this guy and all of a sudden he's not on the up and up. So I almost wish that there was maybe one more issue of who this is and establishing him before really jumping into this because we just have so many threats coming out at them in yeah. their first arc that could we take our time with some stuff. But the only thing that that's a slow burn right now as a serial killer. So yeah, I, I want to know also though, like, I guess we'll get, I guess we'll get the answers in the next issue or two. I want to know what triggered Steph and not cast to get yeah. right. Like, so what is it? Did she, was she exposed to something earlier and there's a trigger? Mm. Um, Cause her eyes are all like crazy. She got yeah. like crazy red eyes, you know, like, and she, all of a sudden she's just kind of looking and she's looking at the, at the billboard and, and Cass is looking there with her. Now Cass is probably wearing some sort of lens that's filtering out whatever it is. So mm-hmm. we, we need, we need to see the man behind the curtain. We need to see how yeah. he is doing this. And they're both, if it's the gas, which I don't know if it's a gas or not, but they're both wearing masks. So. Yeah. I so I would imagine it's filtration. something, it's something with the eyes, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, she was on technology, so maybe it's technology based. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know necessarily know what, how they're doing it. So it's, it's enough of a mystery for me to be like, okay, I'd like to see how they're doing this. Absolutely. And we're, we're bolstering our ranks with some side characters. So here we have Mr. Doll, Dollawall, and then of course, a serial killer neighbor who's a grumpus and uh, Grace O'Halloran is, is another side character. And yeah. I did forget to mention that Barbara is in a wheelchair in this issue where we saw before that she was walking and then was using a cane in the previous issue so the writers did say that she would be in various states of mobility okay out of 10 cup nudes which is what they ate in issue one but they did not i did not see them eat that here what would you give this issue babs was slicing an onion that's about as much food as i said that there was Um, that slice of the onion seven and a half seven and a half Seven and a half cup nudes. Yeah, I I am going to go lower than I did the previous one, which I think I gave it a nine or something. I think maybe an eight, Kate, out of 10 cup nudes. There's a lot going on. I think it was too quick of a drop for Tudor. And the Barbara characterization or what her place is on this team is I'm still a bit baffled with it and it's mm-hmm. not necessarily sitting with me well. So we need to we need to see what that's going to be like. So eight out of 10 cup nudes. Okay. We're wrapping up. We're almost to Tom's favorite segment. This is the reason why almost he likes to, the only reason he likes to come on. I do have one anime uh, film to mention. It's called bell, which just came out 2021, but in um, it just hit theaters 2022, two hours and two minutes. Suzu is a shy everyday high school student living in a rural village for years. She has only been a shadow of herself. 
But when she enters you, a massive virtual world, she escapes into her online persona as Belle, a gorgeous and globally beloved singer. One day, her concert is interrupted by a monstrous creature chased by vigilantes. As their hunt escalates, Suzu embarks on an emotional and epic quest to uncover the identity of this mysterious beast and to discover her true self in a world where you can be anyone. Ryu To Sovakasu no Hime tells a fantastical, heartfelt story of growing up in the age of social media. So it is based off of Beauty and the Beast. It is a visual delight. I really loved it. It's wow. It, there's so much to talk about because Tom's on here. I won't I won't gush over it for hours, but I just highly recommend it. I feel like I, I want to do something with this just to talk about, but there's so many layers of things going on here. And the soundtrack is is also beautiful. And I ended up seeing the, it was at Regal. And so I, I decided to go to the, the Japanese with the English subtitles, but I think the English has a great soundtrack too, but I decide to go with the Japanese. So anyways, I highly recommend that. And now we are on to literature recommendations. Tom, your favorite segment. I'm going to have to. Keep We're not doing it. what are you wearing? <laughs> no, I did see you were wearing a new, uh, a um, nerdy shirt. Would you like to show what you're wearing? Yes. Uh, the greatest American hero. Oh, thank you for wearing a nerdy shirt. You are welcome. Even though it's kind of obscured by the. <laughs> <laughs> That's we got letter. all the the n- n- yeah nerdy person. Yeah, I've got I've got up and down the the wall here. I've got there comics you go. and, and I see an at at over there too. Yeah, there's a Lego at at. There is the right in front of it is a Star Destroyer. Oh, uh, that open? Brett and I put together. Uh, no, it's closed. It's oh, closed. Okay. They're, they're both gray, so it's gray on gray. <laughs> Uh, it's actually underneath the Return of the Jedi poster, okay, and then that, okay. those are DVDs, and then up there, the dragon. Yes, and then that's the Millennium Falcon. Oh, there's a Hogwarts Lego set behind it, <laughs> and then there's some more yeah. beyond. It's there. a nerd cave down there. It's 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 my child's Legos <laughs> that have been down. Your there for child's a while. Legos. We put him together when he was little. When he got okay. Him. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, oh, something I forgot to mention really quickly in the mac and cheese thing. If I'm going to recommend a comic series, Catwoman Lonely City. Oh. By Cliff Chang. Yeah. So good. Okay. I was thinking so just the creative team and the. Good. I was thinking to oh, my gosh. Shot. So good. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's, it's only two issues so far. But, okay. And it's a limited, um, isn't it? I believe so. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a DC Black Label. Oh, yeah. Look. All right. So what do I got? I have. Uh, the Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Uncovering Secrets, Reuniting Relatives, and Upending Who We Are. So it's Ooh. about, it's a nonfiction book by Libby Copeland, which is about the boom in, in kind of consumer genetic testing of like 23andMe and Ancestry and stuff and, and the history behind that science, as well as some stories about how people have had their lives kind of upended or, or have discovered secrets about their family and stuff like that. It's a really interesting read about like the history of that and what goes into it, the concerns about security. And, mm. and it also gets into like police work and, and solving crimes and whether or not this is a right for privacy issue and things like that. So that was really, really cool. A separate piece by John oh. Knowles, which we, you will hear us talk about in a, when is this episode coming out? Next week. Next week. Okay. Yeah. So in about three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that that episode of Required Reading with Thomas Stella will air. The Hour I First Believed by Wally Lamb, which um, I would not recommend, actually. I'm just going through my Goodreads list. Sure. It was, oh, yeah, that's what I'll do. It was yeah. a very long book that had this connection to Columbine High School, and it was, oh, just, it was, it was very, very forced. I will recommend The Wonder Woman by Phil Jimenez Omnibus. Ooh. That was huge. Um, that was really, really good. I, and I have read the first two volumes of Starman, uh, the James Robinson run. Um, I have the trades from the 90s. Um, so I don't know if I don't know how much reprinted that or in print that is lately. Uh, but but I have the sins of the father and night and day. So I'm working my way through all of those trades. And that's been really, really good. And then uh, most recently, um, Batman, the Dark Knight Detective Volume 5. It's collecting the very late very very late 80s very very early 90s batman detective comics issues by mainly by norm uh alan grant and norm brayfogel and this is detective comics 613 14 15 617 613 through 15 617 through 621 and the second annual um so in that you have 
a couple of really, really good one and dones. Uh, the 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 three part of it's called the Penguin Affair. Is the 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 thing of that is not in there. I think it's in another trade because they've been reprinting the Batman comics from that era. Uh, but then it has the two the, the one the detective issue that kind of leads into the two Batman Return of the Joker issues, four fifty four fifty one, and then it has the four parter where Tim Drake's parents are kidnapped, which mm. is right when I these are actually this is this trade is exactly when I started reading Batman. Okay. Back in 1990, so um, it was pretty cool. I I I owned those issues years ago, and I've been collecting this run of trades for a while. And I got this for Christmas from my parents, so it was pretty cool. But yeah, so so uh, so those are all I've been I've read so far, and I have a huge pile of two huge pile of books. Yeah, <laughs> to read. Um, I don't even know what I'm going to read next after I finish the, uh, I'm, I'm reading the bell jar at the moment. So I don't know. Once, once I'm done with that, I'll probably pick something lighter. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, just, you <laughs> You're know, saying the bell jar is not light? No, no. <laughs> I know. I it's know. jaunt <laughs> through Sylvia Plath's oh dear. Oh dear. brain. She does have a wicked sense of humor. We'll, we'll table that for our discussion of her because oh, we sure, are going to yeah. discuss this book in a future re- required reading. Yeah. She does. She is funny in places which yep. and, and, and kind of caustically witty, which I do appreciate. Like a black humor, I suppose. Yeah, she has a very dark sense of humor. Yeah. But. <laughs> okay, so I have read You Can't Touch My Hair and Other Things I Still Have to Explain by Phoebe Robinson. A hilarious and affecting essay collection about race, gender, and pop culture from celebrated stand-up comedian and WNYC podcaster Phoebe Robinson. As a Black woman in America, she maintains sometimes you need to have a sense of humor to deal with the absurdity you are handed on the daily. Robinson has experienced her fair share over the years. She's been unceremoniously relegated to the role of the Black friend, as if she is somehow the authority in all things racial. She's been questioned about her love of U2 and Billy Joel. She's been called uppity for having an opinion in the workplace. She's been followed around stores by security guards. And yes, people do ask her whether they can touch her hair all the time. Now she's ready to take these topics to the page, and she's going to make you laugh as she's doing it. Passing by Nella Larson, which a film just came out Mm -hmm. with... Tessa Thompson and Ruth Vega, Ruth Nega, Ruth Vega, Ruth Nega, I think. And so I was reading this. One of my friends, Shy, read it, and then we were gonna. She was gonna wait for me, and then I read it, and then we watched the film together. But it is about Irene Redfield, who is a black woman uh, living in affluent, comfortable life with her husband and children in the thriving neighborhood of Harlem in the 1920s. And then she reconnects with her childhood friend, Claire Kendry, who is similarly light skinned. But Claire has been passing for a white woman after severing ties to her past. And then they meet again and Claire starts to spend more time with them. And then, well, I don't want to spoil what happens with that, but. Uh, the Smash Up by Allie Benjamin. This was mentioned a year or more ago, I think, by Robert, Robert Ward mm. on our show, because it is a modern take on Ethan Frome. Yes. I yeah. now now it rings a bell. So it is it's really contemporary. It, it deals with me too. It deals with the fallout of the 2016 election. It deals with the Supreme court and all of that stuff that was going on with that one justice that was um, he's already sworn in, but uh, remember the allegations that coming up. Yeah. So I liked that it was contemporary and was bringing this into it, but a lot of the times it was really heavy and heavy handed. And so I wonder if that for me, like who can take that stuff because I'm like, okay, sure, yeah. sure, sure. But then for other people who th- that could potentially like push them off. And so I couldn't tell, like, are you intentionally being heavy handed? Are you trying to push people away from it? I-, I couldn't tell. But also some of the characters are really unlikable. And it's only like the last quarter that I'm like, okay, now I'm feeling some empathy for you. But it was hard at times. So I gave that a three. And mm-hmm. then my final one is Ariadne by Jennifer Saint. I also read a separate piece, but I didn't need to re-mention that. Ariadne by Jennifer Saint. And if you know the tale of Ariadne and Theseus, Theseus, of course, uh, with the Minotaur, then you know that Theseus abandoned Ariadne after she helped him go to the middle and come back out alive from the labyrinth. And so it follows her. It's all in her perspective. And the Minotaur is like, 
killed in the first 100. So you're like, what's going to happen? And you just um, find out more about her and what she, what goes on afterwards, because uh, she does have a relationship with Dionysus or Bacchus takes pity on her. And then also her sister, because her sister ends up marrying Theseus. So that was really good. So in the same vein as Circe, or Patroclus? No, what was it called? Was it called Achilles? I guess it was Achilles. Um, just where they take mm. not necessarily the minor character, but like the side character of an epic hero's story and s- shows what their perspective is. So that was really good. Cersei's yeah. on my pile. Oh, it's a good I got one. that. I got that last year. Her it was really good. It's it's it's, it's, it's sitting it's there somewhere. Waiting. Yeah. It is, it is okay, somewhere. Tom. We're at that point in time where you get to sh- talk about what you're doing and then <laughs> how we can support you and find you. Um, uh, yeah. So you can find me at two podcasts over on Two True Freaks. Uh, one is required reading with mm-hmm. Tom and Stella, which is <laughs> the two of us. Um, <laughs> in fact, the most recent episode, which is Twelfth Night, dropped um, <gasps> as of recording this yesterday so uh it dropped it just dropped uh, tuesday january uh 18th and next week actually right around the time this episode is going to be going to be posted you will hear stella on my other show pop culture affidavit because we're talking about she's the man you can find that also at popcultureaffidavit.com and you can follow me on twitter at pop aff that's p-o-p-a-f-f thank you thank you for coming on yeah, thanks for having me again. It's been a while. I think the last time I was on here, we were doing Tower of Babel. Oh, was that really? long ago? Was Tower of Babel before or after our Judas Contract special that we did? I want to say that was, ooh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. It was either that. So it was either the Tower of Babel storyline or it was the Judas Contract special. Oh, wow. so it has been a while. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we did, you were on for all those Justice Leagues. You yeah, I covered all there. the Morrison yeah. Justice Leagues and then the one that one Mark Wade story. You're right. Crazy, crazy. Well, yeah. I'm glad to have you on. Glad we got to do a Terry Moore. No, it was fun to, fun to be here. So yeah, absolutely. Well, remember to support Tom and you can always send any questions or comments to backroll or call at gmail.com. And if you have any questions for Tom, you can send them my way and I can forward, or do you have an email address? Um, like pop culture, pop culture affidavit at gmail.com. There you go. You can find the show on Google Play and Stitcher. Like the show on Facebook or follow it on Twitter at Backroll the Oracle. Subscribe to the show on YouTube, of course. You can see our winning faces and our winning personalities. And follow the Batman Universe on Facebook and Twitter as well. Support the Batman Universe by subscribing to Patreon. And once again, thanks for My High Comics supporting and sponsoring Backroll the Oracle, the Barbara Gordon podcast. And until next time, Tom, what is it that we say? Fly on, Babs lovers. <laughs> Just plain Barbara Gordon, masquerading for a lark as she rides into the night on her special Batgirl cycle. Who knows? Is the dynamic duo destined to become the triumphant trio? Only time will tell us more about this dazzling dare doll. Ah, I love a happy ending, don't you?